when I was at my most sexually vital and excited about life, mid 30s, I was lean, had a decent amount of muscle, at least for me, and really felt good. My question is though, do you think if you had a gun to your head, did I feel awesome because I was lean and had a decent amount of muscle? Or did I feel awesome because my testosterone was higher than it is now in my mid 40s? And what I'm trying to figure out, because at some point I am going to do TRT, but so far I've done nothing. I haven't even gone out of my way to naturally optimize my testosterone. But I feel like I'm getting to the point now where I need to start really thinking about that. And so I'm just curious, between those two, um, for a guy of any age, if you needed to make them feel like life is worth living, would you optimize testosterone or would you optimize physique? That's tough to say because when you say leaner too, that could be not conducive to optimal testosterone levels too. Because I know a lot of people in the fitness industry, for example, young guys in their 20s who are trying to make a name for themselves and go viral and stand out, they'll literally walk around at 6-7% body fat year round and they look great and their ego is inflated and they get all the compliments and they think it's, you know, the best thing ever, but their testosterone levels are like 200. Whoa. Yeah. They're like literally hypogonadal at 21 years old. Jesus. Yeah. From but, being lean or from? Yeah. Like calorie deprivation, excessive mm -hmm. cardio, like their body is in essentially starvation mode perpetually. There's definitely like a balance to be had where you could try and keep your hormones as ideal as they can be. Well, let's say that I did the blood test and I slide it across the table. What's the first thing that you would look for? You know that the person sliding it across the table saying, I want to feel awesome. Yeah. You go to what? What are like the top three things that you're going to look at? Okay. I guess from the neurological side and muscle building potential side, I would be looking at free testosterone in particular, which would be the freely circulating androgen that dictates muscle growth. If I was to be looking for signaling to actually determine if you were truly hypogonadal or not and needed something like TRT, I would be looking at, they're called gonadotropins, which is the signal from your pituitary to your testes to actually make intratesticular testosterone. So that would be luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Would that go down if I'm on TRT? Those would go to nothingness. Like, Interesting. Yeah, like they would be subclinical and show that you're entirely deficient because you would be using an exogenous source, like pinning exogenous testosterone, which would then tell your brain, we don't need to make any more mm. uh, gonadotropins because we don't need to signal the testes to make any more testosterone or have spermatogenesis either. And that is where fertility rates can decline from using exogenous testosterone as well. And then from there, that's where you get the testicular atrophy from using steroids. Mm. Super interesting. Okay, so that was two. What's the third thing that you would look at? <sighs> Maybe like fasting insulin just to see how insulin sensitive somebody is. I've seen you talk about this on your show multiple times, but it's kind of like your body's ability to actually utilize nutrients effectively and actually like get glucose into muscle. And if you are having resistance to getting the actual energy into cells, you are going to have issues actually being an optimal functioning human and maximizing muscle growth and all of these things. Yeah, it's interesting. So glucose has been my obsession, but now as I start thinking about what's that next level for me as I get older, I really start to think about TRT. Uh, and for people that don't know, testosterone rep replacement therapy. So is that, do you just look at numbers? Is in a blood test, is that an age thing? Like how do you, if you're working with somebody, how do you help them decide? Is it ability to put on muscle? What's the determining factor? Ideally, it's a hybrid of symptoms and biomarkers. However, I'm sure you probably met a guy in your life who had some unreasonably, I don't know, like crazy genetic predisposition to gaining muscle, but then on their blood test, it's not necessarily reflected in, well, how come their testosterone level is only 500 or 600, and I'm not more jacked and I have an 800. Like it doesn't always work that it's just, you have more test equals more muscle than the next guy. It's also, you know, receptor sensitivity, density, gene expression subsequent to that. Like there are a lot of things that play into it. So it's not always down to just the number because hypothetically, you might need more testosterone than the next guy to achieve the same functions from a like physiology perspective. Like you might be able to get away with a 400 total with a free that is two to 3% of that and feel totally fine, have a perfect libido, be a vital human and have nothing going like seemingly wrong. Whereas another guy might have a 600 or 700 and have symptoms of low T because he either needs more 
or too much of it is being bound up by binding proteins because of his lifestyle and or diet model or what have you. Um, so it kind of depends. Like ultimately it would be dictated by, you know, are you waking up with morning wood? Do you still have a good libido? How is it compared to, you know, in your most vital period of life, you know, comparing to your mid twenties or whatever? Um, assessing muscle growth potential, like that is kind of a metric that could be used. Like if you notice your body composition is suddenly declining despite you seemingly having the same routine that you've always had, that would obviously be like a pretty good factor to keep into account. Um, but on blood tests, typically you're going to see the manifestation of low T in that signaling to your testes, or if you actually had, it's called primary hypogonadism is when the testes literally don't respond to those signals. And that's like where TRT becomes the most warranted in general. Mm -hmm. Can you spike the gonadal signaling or do you have to go, like if it's low or it's present, but you're not getting the release of testosterone, is there something that you can do to, to boost that signal? Yeah, so the signal to your testes is all based on a feedback system. So it's your body determining, okay, we don't have enough testosterone and estrogen to facilitate certain functions in the body, so we have to make more but it's going to be dictated too by energy intake, sleep quality, macro and micronutrient intake, not just your protein, carbs, fats, but also the micronutrients you're taking in, the quality of the foods you're eating. All those things are massively impactful on what that signaling capacity will actually be. So it doesn't always boil down to, oh, you were just too lean too. Like if you were following a diet that was totally deficient in fat or deficient in zinc, um, magnesium, like what have you, like certain things that are very, uh, more heavily proportionally contributing to testosterone production, these things can have very negative downward pressure on your pituitary output of these hormones and down the line or downstream to that, prevent you from making as much test as you could. Mm. So as far as like what you could do to spike it, a lot of the same principles that I'm sure you preach regularly on this channel about uh, you know, lifestyle practices, sleep hygiene, diet quality. A lot of people overlook problems with sleep though, with, Things like sleep apnea is very common in men, like a lot more prevalent than people are aware of. And they think they're asleep. Oh, I'm in bed for eight hours and I'm sleeping, but the quality is atrocious. So stuff like that is uh, very impactful. So if I want to put on more muscle, which I do, but <laughs> not so my thing is, is honestly, we were talking about this before we started rolling. Your time is finite. You can only allocate your energy to so many things. You're going through that now with content creation versus actually building businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the same with building a business and building my physique. And so I always tell people, you can tell how much I care about physique by looking at me. I'm not overweight, uh, but I'm also not jacked because uh -huh. it just took so much time and energy to do that. Um, so I would like to put on more muscle. I don't want to be in the gym two hours a day, six days a week. Um, and I know at your Merit Clinic, you guys aren't just like, hey, get on TRT. Like you guys are pretty thoughtful. But so first I want to know, it should one put off TRT as long as they can minus like symptoms that would require that. Like when I heard Rogan say that he started TRT in his thirties, I was like, Whoa, I, I would continue to push it off. Lest you tell me otherwise. <laughs> um, well, the thing with it, it kind of, cause again, you could go by the standards of the medical community or even kind of the more vague interpretation of optimization. It all kind of depends on what is important to you. So hypothetically, if you wanted to push your body harder than even replacement, you could just take full blown steroids mm -hmm. if you wanted to. And it's kind yeah, of- Why wouldn't we? Cause I'm assuming you don't recommend that. Or do it, you? It, that's the thing is, cause when you're saying, should I push off TRT? It's kind of like, well, if you're planning on getting it on it eventually, how much do you care about fertility right now? Um, Zero. Okay, so that's one in favor of the TRT side. Um, then you would look at your actual signaling to your testes and how adequate is it or inadequate, and also what is your your actual response at the organ itself. And then you can kind of dictate, well, is it deficient, horribly deficient? Like, where do I stand on that spectrum to actually get me to how I feel right now? Because again, you have a lot of pillars of health that are super dialed that are also supportive of you like potentially being right on the brink of feeling not great. Like, I don't really know where you stand on that spectrum, but everything is contributing in some facet to some degree. And TRT, maybe it takes you up to the top of that spectrum. Maybe you're on, like some guys are teetering on like the brink of like being sub-functional in terms mm -hmm. of not uh, having a high quality of life. It kind of depends. So as much as I would love to say, 
you know, wait five years or wait specifically this amount of time. It would very much depend on a lot of context about your own individual situation. All right. So deciding when to do TRT really comes down to if it's not disrupting my life, if I'm sleeping well, if I feel good, if my, in fact, check me if any of these are the wrong things to look at. If my libido is high enough, if I have sort of that, you know, zest for life, I feel driven, I'm still going, probably not the time to do it. Probably not. So if I want to start adding muscle and my T were deficient, because if that's not today, it's going to be a day soon. How do I approach this? Do I want to take testosterone directly? Do I want precursors? How do you go when somebody comes to you and is like, hey, I've tried sort of all the um, basic stuff. How do I now accelerate this? Personally, for me, it would be like a full blown analysis of their actual diet quality, which could involve like there's there's programs that you can use online. Like uh, there's one called Chronometer. You can just plug your diet in. It'll show the actual micronutrient density of what you're eating, like how many vitamins and minerals of each there are in the food you're eating. And then from there, you can actually pinpoint if you have a real deficiency that is contributing or not. Um, And then that's where targeted supplementation could actually be warranted rather than just blindly taking a bunch of stuff. Um, So there's that. And then assessing your... What are some basic supplementation? Like what's a common thing you see? Yeah, vitamin D, huge. Um, Do you advise that through sun exposure or through supplementation? Depends on vitamin D, man, because it's like modern day. Is it the most conducive to vitamin D that perhaps than it was hundreds of years ago? It's kind of, I don't really know what the answer is to that. But all I do know is I see a lot of low vitamin D statuses Mm -hmm. these days, and it's very, very prevalent. And a lot of the working environments and lifestyles are very anti-conducive to getting enough vitamin D from outside. So, and some people, it's just like literally where they live. So maybe supplementation is warranted. Says the man from Canada. Yeah, (laughs) I I have to use vitamin D myself. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I'm assuming sleep is in there as uh, one of the basics. Do you consider working out as a way to spike testosterone? Yeah, it's kind of like, I figure what's called the Goldilocks zone, or I don't know what the, the terminology is, but basically too much of it could be the opposite of helpful, but too little also not gonna be helpful too. Mm. So having, you know, like a good resistance training routine where you were focused on trying to progressively overload and gain strength rather than just fluff workouts, going through the motions kind of stuff. Um, is and the that's mo- more important than cardio? Um, for muscle, certainly. For- and muscle is gonna increase my test more than cardio? Yeah, building a good, Muscle focused body composition is the most conducive to that for cardiovascular health. Having like ultimately, these are things that shouldn't be should I do one or the other? Like, you should be doing both right. ultimately. So, um, both are going to be helpful, but I would say making sure at minimum you're getting in your heavy lifts for the week, the most important of the weight lifting. Do you consider exercise. heavy a rep range thing? Yeah, like, uh, in general, it kind of depends on what. You are going for though, because some people, you know, they're power lifters and they are prioritizing strength over hypertrophy. So the range will differ for them. But in general, like standard eight to 12 rep ranges using weights that you're not going to go to complete failure on your first set, but by the last set, you're hitting failure on the last rep kind of thing. And then trying to progressively overload and add a pound or two every single workout and focusing on that, keeping a very regimented logbook too. A lot of people will just do the same exercise and the same weights for years on end and then wonder why their physique doesn't change, but they have not been tracking anything when they could have been otherwise micro loading every single time they go in the gym. Like there are literally like 0.5 pound increment plates you can buy on Amazon that you can just chalk on if five pounds is too high of an increment, which is a problem at some gyms. Like you have to, at some point you're going to plateau. And at that point, is it reasonable to add five pounds every time you show up no, you're going to be, you know, stuck spinning your wheels a bit. And that's where using micro increments or going up by rep, you know, doing another rep on the on the set instead might be a goal. But I found those like 0.5 pound plates really, really helpful. What about, so your size, your duration of working out, I assume you've been working out since teens or 20s. Yeah. So for me, what I found was I I got to the point where there were just, I, it was always a battle between I'm trying to get my weights to go up, but I keep getting injured. Have you, given how long you've been at this, are you still like heavier lifts, more reps? Or at some point do you go, yeah, this is the weight that I do and I'm just going to stick here? 
Yeah, for me, I have prioritized other things over body composition for a while now. Like You're I would, still jacked. <laughs> not nearly as much as I was, but I also, it would be unreasonable for me to expect to have maintained my lifts at what they were because I used to use reasonable amounts of steroids, mm. whereas now I don't use those. So um, for me, though, I've just, uh, I try to progressively overload when I go in the gym still um, and track uh, with a log. Well, it's not. Oh, it's an app, not a log book, but you can use a book or an app if you want. Um, but yeah, I still try to focus on the same principles. But it's certainly, it's not the same weight that I was using back in the day. Mm. But it is the same principles applied, and still trying to make progress. Because if you're not trying to make progress in the gym, like you're not giving the adequate stimulus to tell your body, okay, you need to actually grow to support this load. Because at some point, it gets used to what you're doing, and then you need to actually tell your body, hey. You know, this is an increasing demand on muscle, so build more to mm. support it because you can't do it right now. So how do you, I mean, you're big, like maybe not bodybuilder big, but you have very robust, which I'm sure comes across on camera, even hiding under your sweater over there. Um, so how much time do you have to put in to maintain it? Like for somebody that really wants to build a physique, what are those straightforward principles that you're still deploying? Maintaining is magnitudes easier than gaining muscle, which I guess is sort of something people can look forward to is as much as it seems like a daunting task to build a bunch of muscle once you're there, actually retaining it is not that difficult. Um, or at least I don't think so, given that you're not using a bunch of hormones to support it. Mm. Um, so for me, typically I can maintain my physique on just like a few days a week. Um, ideally four days a week is kind of my schedule now, an hour in the gym, in and out, uh, any more than that. Hour gym, how many days a week? Four days. Yeah. And for me, that's just a classic split of, you know, chest, shoulders, back, another day is arms and legs. Um, I think, I don't think I'm missing anything there. Um, calves on legs as well. Um, if I came in during your workout, would I think you were trying to kill yourself? No, I don't think so. Interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like. The minimum, minimum effective volume I can do to maintain what I have is what I do because I also get my mental bandwidth sapped when I go really hard in the gym. Mm -hmm. So if I was allocating my priorities to gaining muscle and trying to build my physique up, my volume would look different and higher than it does at just maintenance amount. So. When you were adding the muscle, if I had seen you work out, would it look like you were trying to kill yourself? Maybe when I'm going to failure, on the last set of each exercise, but I still do that. But were you exercise. like a guy that was like screaming ah! in there two hours a day? <laughs> no, like, no. What did that look like? I think that's a common misconception that you need to be in there for hours a day, six, seven days a week. Like even for a bodybuilder who's a professional and is taking copious amounts of steroids, they would probably not be in there seven days a week for two hours. Interesting. Yeah. Because at some point you're just doing so much damage to the muscle, you're never recovering? Like Yeah, it's called junk volume. When you're just going above and beyond what you need and it's almost like anti-helpful. That's interesting. So where is the sweet spot? You get a guy. He's a total dweeb. What do we do? So uh, let's start Natty and yeah. then maybe we'll, we'll veer in a second. But so starting him off, supernatural. But we, we need to get this kid jacked. No fucking around. We have 18 months to do it. Mm -hmm. So one, how many pounds if we, he does whatever you tell him, he eats what you tell him, he sleeps when you tell him, he yeah. micronutrients, all of it. This kid is religious. He does exactly what you tell him to do. What is that going to look like for him? Like, what do we, what do we start him off with? Probably figure out what his maintenance calories is, which is how much he needs to eat to not either gain or lose weight. 2,000. Okay. So that's super low, but anyway, yeah, let's just say we it's need two, a number. Yeah, so two thousand. It's probably gonna be closer to three thousand. Really? Yeah. What? Yeah. For maintenance? For a guy who's exercising regularly and is okay, young. Okay. This like, is because he's gonna work out. Yeah. If you were just sedentary and doing absolutely nothing, then you're just basically expending energy for your like movements, sitting down, like your fidgets and stuff, which okay. is a lower calorie amount. I think it's called a non-exercise or non-activity exercise thermogenesis or something. It's like your neat calories is how much you're going to expend just by functioning as a human. And then on top of that is all your activity, which you then factor in for your caloric intake. What's the average person? 21 year old guy. What's the average 21 year old? Uh, I think when you, fa if they are working out and exercising, 
their maintenance might fall between like 2,700 to 3,000. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so our guy's at that, let's say. But now we're going to get him in the gym. How many days a week? I would start with four probably. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. So every other day would be fine. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so now we get him in the gym. Are we using your split, which you said was back, ch- sorry, shoulders, chest, back. What did you do on back day? Back buys? It buys? was just back. Yeah. yeah it kind of, for me, it's... Just back or back buys? I do just back. But Really? Do you get buys our own day or do you yeah. treat arms on the same arms day? Arms is one day. Yeah. Your mix is weird. Walk me through yeah. it again. Again, it would depend on what your weak points are. So if it's a newbie, it's totally different. For me, like for example, my shoulders are my dominant body part, so I just shove it at the end of chest day and I barely... Because your they, shoulders grow easily? Yeah, and they maintain easily too, so I don't really put that much volume into them. So for me, it's a dictation of my weekly volume based on how much I can actually di- allocate before I'm fatigued, and then I distribute that volume accordingly based on the body parts that need more attention. So I have a terrible chest, so I do more on chest, versus delts, I barely touch them. So for a newbie... I'm angry with you. Right <laughs> I just wanna, I want the record okay. to reflect. Well, maybe you have a better chest than your me. Your shoulders so maybe are beast be. mode. Okay. Okay, so we've we've got the kid. It's every other day. Yeah, we're gonna allocate his energy based on what he sucks at. For now, but we'll, it's we'll like figuring assume. out what he sucks at is impossible if he's never done it. So yeah. I would just do like basic, you know, the compound, three lifts, you know, bench, squat, deadlift. I would allocate those to you know, squat on your leg day, deadlift on your back day, bench press on your chest day, and then you know, fill in other complementary exercises depending on you know. I would probably start him on really low volume to begin with, and then see how much he can handle. Um, is it so fatiguing that it's like affecting his next workout where he's not performing as well? And you kind of like micro adjust from there, but starting with just, you know, a few really strong exercises, like it's not rocket science. You do like three to four sets of each, eight to 12 reps, whatever you can handle. But actually the thing is, is sometimes coaches will need the clients to send videos of doing the exercise because their interpretation of what going hard enough is actually not going hard enough. Mm -hmm. So me just telling him do eight to 12 reps. Like, I don't actually know that he's going hard enough. I think a good target is by the last set of that exercise, you are hitting failure by like the tail end of that set. So like your last rep is almost impossible for you to do and you need a spotter essentially. Should you be able to walk out of the gym normally if you're leg day or should you On your first leg day ever, you will be a cripple for a week. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. Yeah. But that's just because it's a virgin muscle. Not Dude, be The first time I... So I very consciously went from I don't work out to I work out like a demon. Yeah. And uh, no one gave me that warning. <laughs> and so I put photos of Hugh Jackman. This is like peak Hugh Jackman Wolverine. Okay. I've got him plastered everywhere. I'm going to look like Hugh Jackman. I'm going all in. So go in, go so hard that if I sat in a chair for more than five minutes, when I would get back up, I would have to stop, stretch before I could walk again. It yeah. was unreal. But that became my benchmark. I didn't want to get that far because that, that actually made it hard to move. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember one time at the end of a workout, so this is, I was very poor at the time, and my driver's side car door didn't unlock. So you had to unlock the passenger side door, reach across and mm-hmm. unlock the driver's side. And I had just done chest and chest, shoulders, tries, which I would do on the same day. And I put my arm down on the seat to reach across to unlock it. And my arm just... <laughs> It like gave way and I fell on my face and I was like, that's when you know you've worked out hard enough. (laughs) Or was that stupid? And that was just, we're now into, it's moving me backwards. Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to say, oh, you went too hard to a newbie because they're super sore on day one. I think that's kind of expected, but they don't need to do as much as almost anyone else who has been actively doing it for years because such a little stimulus is needed to achieve growth at that point Mm -hmm. that you can get away with much less volume at the start and still get your newbie gains going. So it's kind of like, you know, there's no magic number. Um, But um, yeah, if you walk out on your leg day, like honestly, after three sets of squats on your first leg day ever, you're probably gonna be sore, even if you're a newbie, if you actually like 
went close to failure. Mm. That's just expected from a virgin muscle. So I wouldn't read too much into it unless you were literally doing like, I don't know, 20 sets of body part or something. That would be way overkill for a newbie. Um, if they were just starting, well, maybe not way overkill. Kind of depends on, again, how hard are you going on those sets? Right. So he's only got 18 months, though. So ballpark me. If 20 is probably too many sets per body part, what is the. He's doing what Derek tells him to do. Yeah, I think um, maybe like, again, this is just like a ballpark number, but maybe like 60 sets a week. And then the last allocating those between the four workouts and again like the split if it's two 60 sets per week per body part no total total. split across how all the days and if that was too intense for somebody too they could technically split one of those days into another day in itself like chest and shoulders a lot of people they need their shoulders or their chest not like some supporting body parts might be fatigued that otherwise would warrant separating that body part into a separate day. Like for you, obviously your triceps are not going to do as well by the time you get to them after you've done a bunch of bench press and stuff. So for a newbie, after he's hit his, you know, failure set on bench, and then you tell him to go do what's his like main compound tricep exercise that he might be doing. Maybe he's doing, if he does a close grip bench press or something, like good luck, you're going to get zero out of that because you're so destroyed at that point. So that's where, you know, a separate arm day might make sense. So how you split that up again, like there's so many free programs online from people who are reputable in the space with uh, workout programs and whatnot. So um, I think it's pretty easy and accessible to find that now, but ultimately like 60, 70 sets a week, if you can handle it 80, but like, I think that'd be a good starting point and just separating that across four or five days, depending on how you want to do the split. If you want to have a you know, a separate shoulder day from your chest day or not. It kind of depends, again, on your time and whatnot. But, um, and then, yeah, just going to failure in your last exercise of uh, the set. And it's uh, not that complicated. And make sure you get your body weight and protein per day in grams. Um, and If it's not that complicated, why do so few people have physiques? Um, because I think a lot of unrealistic standards are putting being put out there by people in the industry that walk around, you know, with 200 total T's who are natural that maintain these absurdly low body fat percentages. And then also guys who are on steroids and, you know, are very forthcoming or not forthcoming about but them. Why using would it. that make, so I'm going to, I'll give you a counter argument. They're lazy. Okay. So put it this way. You thought the Hugh Jackman 2001 physique was great. Ask anyone in the fitness industry if that was good. They'd be like, okay, skinny fat. <laughs> yeah. Not kidding. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But let's take this head on. So, I don't think it's bad role models. I think it's laziness. You think it's unrealistic expectation. Why would that stop somebody from getting a physique? Because they give up? Yeah. I just think there are a lot of, there's a lot of skewing of what people see as a good physique now. As opposed to, I think they could achieve the Hugh Jackman 2001 naturally. Mm-hmm. And with, you know, most people could probably do that. It's just, there is so much saturation of fitness industry physiques now that it has anyone who's kind of following that i don't know niche of content and maybe it is a bit more of a subsection so maybe it is only a certain subsection of people that have the work perception including myself but it certainly is inflating what is perceived to be good Mm. so i think again the people who aren't achieving somewhat a semblance so we're arguing about the word good yeah Uh which is all subjective yeah. 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 Okay. So fair, but I will say I very quickly got into a bodybuilding universe. So I know the most like distorted physiques ever. And I remember one time coming into work and showing my partners like, I want to look this guy on the cover of whatever mm-hmm. uh, bodybuilding magazine. Uh, I was like, I want to look like this. And they were like, guaranteed that guy's Photoshop. They're like, there's no universe in which, even with drugs, that somebody has a chest that bubbly. Mm. And, but even that, like having something to aim at, having something that excited me so much, the idea of being able to one day look like that, even though there was no universe in which I was ever going to get there because it was Photoshop, probably steroids plus Photoshop, Mm. like really like extreme, extreme it still was exciting. And so it got me to go into the gym. And so when I look at the people that I love, that, and especially when I used to be leaner and bigger, people used to come up to me all the time. Like, what do you do? What do you eat? All that. And I was 
as natural as they come, which is why my physique was meh by most people's like a high level guy. Be like, this guy's a joke. He's fucking tiny and he's fat. Uh, <laughs> but I felt really good. And so people would come up to me a lot. What do you do? How do you eat? Like, how do you get that physique? And my answer was always like, it's pretty basic mm -hmm. in terms of like getting lean and getting bigger two separate things. So let's make sure we separate those out. I first got muscle and then I leaned down and I did it really stupidly and nobody should take my advice, but you can, I'm walking around with the results. So that is what it is. But my thing was like, the only hard part here is actually not eating the thing that you want to eat and then actually doing the reps and being willing to be like, oh, I think I'm about to throw up. So if you can do that, like you're going to get the physiques. Yeah, I would argue that you probably don't need to work to feeling like you're throwing up though as well. So maybe that might even be putting people who are completely new hearing you say that. They're mm -hmm. like, oh, like no chance I'm doing that now. Maybe on like a heavy squat or a leg that, press. Truly. Then, I'm then, certainly wasn't asking myself that every day. I'm too lazy for that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, like honestly, there is uh, most people that don't have the physique that is the peak of their genetic potential is out of lack of willpower and adherence to something consistently, ultimately. Mm. So it's not like, oh, I'm not going to work out because of this insane expectation I would never reach. It's also laziness too. But it depends on the person. I was just saying, you know, the, the celebrity goal physique is oftentimes unattainable because it's not realistic. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So we'll get to that in a second. There's something I want to ask you about that specifically. But first, do you regret doing hardcore steroids? No, because it made me very aware of my health and learning more about optimization and skewed me in the direction I am now, which is a lot more... Uh, it's not necessarily longevity focused because again circling back to the first discussion we had about should you take trt or not there's like absolutely something to be said about if you wanted to push your body as long as you're aware of the give and take relationship of the pros and cons of it you don't necessarily have to do anything within the confines of what is socially acceptable so if you were wanting to take a shit ton of steroids, like you, you could, it would just be unhealthy, but there is potentially some level of, well, maybe I want to push my body a little bit and maybe it takes a couple of years off my life, but maybe the quality of life is significantly better via this. So for me, it's, uh, I don't know, I try to gauge these things in a more, uh, what I deem to be realistic way, because I want a high quality of life too. So I, I feel like I've experienced the aggressive polar extreme of I am deteriorating my body for this extreme outcome that is basically just cosmetically pleasing and is inflating my ego. And then on the other side of the spectrum, I'm very aware of the longevity research and the anti-aging stuff. Be as frail and gaunt as you can until the last day you die, but you live to 100, so great fucking job. I want to kind of meet in the middle. That's where I'm at. So having that, I don't know, the education or learning about both sides has been very helpful and educational to me personally. And I think helps me impart that knowledge on, I don't know, the people who are interested that follow my stuff. Mm. But do you, is, do you think there is a moral case against people doing steroids? Like, do you have no problem? Hey, you understand this is gonna shorten your life a little bit, but hey, if you're good, I'll walk you through how to do it well. Like, are you unconflicted, you give that advice, or is there a little like, uh... Well, there's obviously some nuance, especially now that I have a telemedicine platform and things like some people might think, oh, he's trying to like promote taking hormones via the clinic or what? Like, I, mm. I feel like I'm pretty, I've remained unbiased in that, even from the business side of things, like I would prefer people get the full context of their situation before they haphazardly jump on hormones. Because for us, like we make money on services and blood work and education of our patients, not necessarily just here's a script to test and ask for all this, that, get out the door and we'll just make our money on the medication. Like that's not how we do business. So for me, it's always been about the education and I don't really care what people do as long as they are educated about it ideally before they go into it. Like when I was younger and I started taking gear, steroids, I wish I knew a lot of the stuff I know now in hindsight and that is kind of the... I don't know, manifestation of a lot of my content is stemmed from my experiences with that and what I wish I knew and education. What do you wish you knew back then? What do I wish I knew? Yeah. Um, mainly 
the impacts on the cardiovascular system. Um, that and that it deforms the heart? Yeah, it's uh, morphology and function, like the shape, size, function of it, all can be very significantly impacted from mm. basic negligence on something as simple as your blood pressure not being modulated or assessing it. Like some people don't even check it and they'll be walking around like stage two hypertension perpetually because of the drugs they're on. And then they end up with a heart attack at, you know, 35 years old or younger. I've seen people die in their 20s. Jesus. Yeah. From that? Wall. Indirectly, but it's yeah. because of the downstream effects of that. Oh, so, God. And the problem, too, is when I first started bodybuilding and getting heavily into learning about performance-enhancing drugs and whatnot, there was this sentiment that went around the industry, like, where are the bodies? And it wasn't very documented who's dying because it was not very highlighted. Social media wasn't really, like, prominent. And it just really wasn't talked about that much. And typically, the only people that get reported on that die are big names in the industry. So a lot of people, like bodybuilding wasn't like a mainstream sport anyways, if you can even call it a sport. And it just wasn't really being noted. And you oftentimes couldn't attribute a death solely to steroid use anyways, because if somebody dies at 40, it's like, oh, the genetic predisposition or this or that. And it's like, well, yeah, but the steroids plus the pre genetic predisposition mm -hmm. make it way worse so yeah it's uh stuff i wish was more uh it's the problem though is that education didn't exist too so it's you know i wish i had it but it wasn't really readily available as well mm. so that's kind of where i think now is great because people are, at least who are jumping into this stuff have education at their fingertips for free letting them know hey this is the reality of this stuff if you're gonna go down that path and it's not risk-free. And here are the very real manifestations of risk profile that you could expect in the coming years. And if you're going to do it anyways, how to try and attenuate that risk as much as you can. Why does it piss you off when people lie about steroids? It doesn't really piss me off. I just think it's like disingenuous. And oftentimes it kind of depends on the person and the context. But if you're trying to sell a product or a service that is marketed around your physique, and then you are heavily implying that it is solely your workout program or solely your the coaching or whatever. And it's like, yeah, these things are obviously the underpinnings of how you built the physique, but like you also would be 30 pounds lighter if you weren't on steroids. So I feel like there's an obligation to at least give that context. Like, hey, by the way, this is also in the equation for me, and this is why I look the way I do. Because it could otherwise be misleading if you're this guy walking around who's, who's this larger-than-life persona and people are trying to aspire to be like and you're also selling workout programs or what have you and then you are or supplements or what, whatever it is and you are not being transparent and forthcoming about, hey, like, this is what I do, but I also do this other stuff, which is massively impactful on the end outcome. Would you have full respect for uh, an influencer, coach, whatever, that was like, okay, here, here's my workout routine. I hope you sign up. It's going to be amazing. Uh, here's the gear that I take. And uh, I've got here, you know, 30 people that have taken my course. They're all natural. You can look at their results. Not as cool as me because I'm on the gear, so I look way better. Would you be like, yeah, fuck yeah. Or would you still be like, oh, God, eh, there's gear involved. And even though he's being honest, it's just not as cool. No, it's fine. As long as you're just, again, it's like realistic expectations. If you're marketing it as if you are representing your out, end outcome as an expectable and repeatable process, when it's just not without hormone augmentation, mm -hmm. that's where it gets murky. If you're an enhanced guy and you just have good information on diet, but you don't talk about your drugs too, like I don't really have a problem with it necessarily. It's more when you're representing an outcome that is tied to something you're lying about is more the issue. So oftentimes, you know, it's kind of irrelevant to me personally. Okay, so now my real question that all this is preamble to, do you think it's cheating in sports if people do um, performance enhancing drugs? If it's against the rules of their sport, like it depends, like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for example, rampant steroid use, but it's kind of unspoken that the majority of people are just using drugs. They can, it's, that is like the most finicky conversation in that sport because it's technically not banned via you're not getting tested but it's also somewhat frowned upon if you're you know the gearhead and maybe not everyone else you know if if you if you're natural and you're competing against guys on gear like obviously you're going to think there's an uneven playing field in a sport that is actually 
regulated and tested according to WADA standards or whatever it is, yeah, like cheating is cheating. So it's just a very, very prominent thing that's So still you happens. wouldn't like the double standard. So it's like, uh, nobody's getting tested, still think maybe mm, it's not ideal because it it isn't like you know what people are doing or you know what the rules are. So it still could create an uneven playing field. Definitely hate it in a sport where they say you can't. And so if there are people that are finding a way around it, that's really shitty. So I'm all for a world where uh, we just say, hey, that we have these exogenous substances that people can take. And instead of drawing a line, I just want it to be out in the open. Yeah. And so that there is no double standard so that people can decide whether they want to do it. But like for, take something like BJJ or cycling, and I'm not an expert man, and so who the hell knows like how many people actually do it or not. But for me, hearing that, oh, yeah, everybody's doing the blood doping or whatever in the Tour de France. I don't go, oh, now the Tour de France isn't cool. I go, damn, like these guys go hard. Like they're <laughs> taking their blood out of their body. They're hyper oxygenating it. They're putting it back in. And it's like, I might say, I think that's pretty dumb because of the high risk and like the odds of you dying are just astronomical. But man, I want to see, I want to see humans push themselves. Now, I get though that what I'm saying, like, hey, that walks a line. Do we want kids emulating that? Do we want to put yeah. that out there? So is there like, is this just Tom not having thought enough about it? Or is it like, hey, once you get into the professional leagues, let people push themselves. It's tough, man, because it's like, I don't think there's a definitive answer to that. And many debates could be had about it. I think that sport is entertainment at the end of the day. So it comes down to a debate as to well, if you want to make it as entertaining as possible, obviously, sauce everyone to the gills. And that would be the logical answer if you wanted the max entertainment factor. And then it comes after that. It's like, well, do you want to be encouraging drug use among the youth to then aspire to be like fill-in-the-blank professional athlete? You know, if they're going to be getting paid this much, is that something that they should just take that risk in order to get that outcome? Mm. I don't have the answer, man. It's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Because, yeah, I, I definitely don't want to encourage kids to do it. That one really scares me. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, when you get into the professional leagues, so many people are doing it. I would rather just see, like, what's the truth of what people are doing? So, obviously, the Conor McGregor thing is utterly fascinating. He's allowed to step out of the testing pool. And as long as he gets tested for six months, he can come back in. Yeah. Now, I don't know shit about like steroid use, but it looks like he's probably yeah. uh, been doing something. He and sort of admitted as much indirectly, seemingly. And my thing is, I don't have a beef with that. Yeah, I mean, either. I, you know, if it's conducive to his injury recovery and it gets him out there quicker, like if it's within the confines of the rules, like go for it. I, I think just a lot of people, I don't know if he became aware of this rule through like his connections or whatnot, or like finagling it in some special way that he was kind of given more leniency, or if it's just, you know, his location, it makes it more problematic and harder to test them because they have to outsource people who test on behalf of USADA in Ireland. Who really knows? But, you know, at the end of the day, there's hormone use in seemingly all sports. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Even as I'm giving my own answer, it... No, you can, like, hear yourself say it and then almost debate against yourself. Yeah, well, so the thing, the, the right question is, do you want kids doing that? And that I definitely do not, especially because you get parents that want to see their... There was a kid that I went to middle school and high school with. Now, I don't know him well enough to... I would certainly not say his name in case I'm wrong about this. But what I heard was that he was on steroids. Now, when I say this kid had density of muscle at 12, I'm talking it was unreal. And that always worried me that if that was true, that that was pressure from his parents and wasn't, I just can't fathom it. How, at 12, how do you even get steroids? Yeah. But he, he was a freak. And um, he, he was, I think he was like 5'8", and he could high jump seven feet. Sheesh. It was unreal. Unreal. Yeah. And so that that worries me that he has potentially, if it's true, done you know long lasting damage, and I have to imagine that parents were involved. 
Yeah, I remember tons of guys in my high school that would take gear for... Really? Yeah, for... Is that just because you're so young? It seemed so... Yeah, for football, trying to get a good uh, scholarship to a college or university that is going to get them further in their aspirations. And, yeah, it's uh, pretty obvious when somebody shows up to gym class and all of a sudden you can bench 50 more pounds within Mm. six weeks. Jesus. Yeah. That's interesting. Now, BJJ guys don't see I don't pay enough attention but I don't think of BJJ guys as having physiques so are they doing it for recovery or are they all jacked and I just don't pay enough attention well, body weight is very very important for moving people around and again I'm not a BJJ expert by any means but obviously if you're a heavyweight the more muscle you have on the easier you can impart and like get that is that broken down into weight classes yeah but there, it's there's deviations between them and ranges so obviously if you're at the top end of your weight class it's more ideal than being at the mm-hmm. bottom or the middle mm-hmm. and the more you can push a guy around and use your weight to your advantage hugely impactful obviously force production hugely impactful too on anything to do with manipulating somebody else's body who's fighting against you um, oxygen carrying capacity significantly increased when you're on androgens really? like, yeah there's yeah. a lot of benefits from it like you could like it stimulates the release of EPO as well, through EPO, erythropoietin. So, like, the, never heard of that. Really? What is that? It's like the main drug used by cyclists, or it was anyway. When I say this is not okay. my world, it's I find like it the, the precursor it. to actually making new red blood cells. Hmm. Yeah. So, increasing your oxygen carrying capacity in sport, obviously, like broad spectrum beneficial in essentially anything you're doing, with exception of like, I don't know, archery or something. And there's drug use in that too, beta blockers. For what? Anxiety? If you can slow your heart rate and calm down, way easier to shoot a target. Whoa. Yeah. And if you use certain beta blockers that cross the blood brain barrier, like propranolol, you can actually like very significantly calm yourself down and get like an ang- anxiolytic, like anti anxiety effect. So it's uh, very common among public speakers, um, pianists. Also using it. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, a lot of people use beta blockers. Drugs worry me, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm not like if I needed a drug, I would take a drug. I'm just trying to limit the number of times that I need a drug, whether it's Tylenol, Advil, anything. I try to limit the amount, but that's from a longevity standpoint, not from a like I want to see people perform at their best. See, it's interesting though, because it's like there's definitely something to be said about some genetic risk factors are so aggressive and unique that pharmacology may be the only way to attenuate your risk for longevity purposes. So if you had familial hypercholesterolemia, for example, mm-hmm. are you going to avoid taking a cholesterol or lipid modulating medication? Yes. Okay. But am I wrong? I mean, maybe. Here's the thing. I, I don't, I'm not coming from a place of superior knowledge. I'm coming from a place of paranoia. And so I'm just like, oh, I get it. But like, whenever people take drugs, there are second and third order consequences that we're not thinking about. And so that's the thing that worries me. I don't have a a moral compunction with it, but it's like, uh, if I can avoid it. It's just weighing the ROI. So it's like, is whatever benefit I could get out of the drug going to outweigh the potential side effect burden, even in the TRT side of things? Especially the side effect burden that we don't yet understand. Yeah, That's the one that worries me. Thing though is, is some people have genetic predispositions that you know you're not functioning correctly. If you have a complete deficiency in the production of an enzyme, for example, or you're not going to take a drug that might facilitate this function because I want to be natural, like I feel like that would be potentially moronic. That would be moronic in my estimation, yeah. Anything where I felt like it was impacting the quality of my life, or if I really believe, like from a longevity standpoint, I'm actually going to live longer based on the... Well, in fact, I was going to say based on my you know, genetic limitation or problem or whatever, but do you know much about rapamycin? Yeah. Okay, so rapamycin, I there were people really pushing me to do, um, God, what's the other diabetic drug that everybody's like, metformin. you've got metformin. Everyone was like, bro, you got to get on metformin, you don't understand. And now, of course, data's coming out where it's like, well, if you need it and you're a diabetic, yes, better to take it than not take it. But if you're not a diabetic, it could, at a minimum, blunt the impact of working out Mm-hmm. and may have other knock-on effects. And it's that kind of thing where, you know, follow the science. 
probably a bad way to say it since science is, hey, we're going to be wrong. We know we're wrong. And so we're going to keep refining, refining, refining based on the data. And so follow the data might make a lot more sense. Um, but rapamycin is the first one where I'm like, ooh, maybe this there really is, is something. I think ultimately this is where educating yourself is the most important though, because for you with a CGM, for example, you can assess what your blood glucose control is like and post, post prandial response to bringing that back down into range through going for a walk versus metformin, 10 minute walk, more effective than metformin in studies. Or you can use metformin. interesting. Yeah, so, but again, does that mean metformin has no utility? Depends on the context, but if you are checking your metrics meticulously, like presumably you do and have all these things going on, you could probably set, like be able to tell better than the data for your specific situation, is it a worthwhile drug to be using? Mm. What do you think about rapamycin? Do you think it's going to end up being bullshit like everything else or um, it's not like everything else? But The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I want to take you through that will 100x your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. I don't know enough about it to say for certain, but I think anything that is anti mTOR, IGF-1, what have you, will have some positive impact on longevity potentially. But again, it circles back to the whole ROI on vitality of life, quality of life relative to that extra few years you've tacked on. Mm. So I think there is a way seemingly, and this is my just perception, to implement it with a negligible impact to any perceivable you know, downsides from it. Like I, I think people like microdose it on an infrequent basis and see no perceived impact in a deleterious way to their performance or anything. But that is just what I've heard anecdotally from uh, um, some of my colleagues and whatnot but i have never used it i haven't really looked into it that thoroughly and could be worthwhile but it kind of to me probably stems back to the whole context dependent situation and assessing what it does to you like sometimes you just have to take shit and then see what happens you know like if you're worried about what's going to happen like you almost sometimes it's just take the drug and then see if it affects you bad and you can pull it out and the half-life is short enough that's out of your system in five days so what what are the things that you've experimented with like that that you think, meh, there's something interesting here. And as evidenced by the fact that you you either use it with some degree of frequency or you use it continuously. I do use azetamibe, which is a cholesterol absorption inhibitor essentially. And I feel like if I can keep my ApoB down, I have I personally have better peace of mind that I'm not going to end up with black buildup. Now again, I could hypothetically get scans done regularly and mm -hmm. and check for soft plaque buildup before it becomes calcified and actually get a CAC score down the line. Like I can probably, you know, I could probably assess that and regularly and figure out is my lifestyle and diet and everything conducive to that outcome to begin with where I even need to be on the medication. But it's been a lot more difficult for me to get access to that kind of diagnostic service, even in Canada, even as a telemedicine service provider myself, I have to go to the States to get stuff done and it's problematic. So for me, taking a medication proactively based on what I've seen in my blood work has been worthwhile to date. Maybe in the future I'll drop it, but that is something that I've been using myself. You, so obviously the body needs cholesterol. Is there something that you do in your lifestyle that you think is um, creating an inappropriate cholesterol response? Yeah, so I'm on TRT for context. So Okay, and that spikes your cholesterol. That lowers your HDL a decent amount. And then LDL can be slightly elevated a little bit. It inhibits uh, lipid metabolism to some extent. Interesting. Yeah. Is that because it's exogenous or is there like guys just have a naturally problematic cholesterol? The reason why it has influence on these enzymatic processes, I don't really know physiologically why it happens. It's almost, you know, it could be a feedback loop from if you have androgens coming in in, because again, when you administer this stuff, it's coming in in a bolus that is not really representative of what would be normal and endogenous. You have a diurnal rhythm that, you know, pulses multiple times and you have a, they're 
relatively small and they go up and down and it fluctuates just like for example when you get your blood work get it done in the morning because that's when your test is at its highest because if you get it done in the afternoon you might be 200 points lower just based on the time of day which is notable but that sort of thing is like there are feedback systems and similar to what you said what's happening two three steps down the line you know with uh lipids there is absolutely an influence from exogenous androgens and the more androgens you apply the worse it gets hmm yeah. What about, uh, do you worry at all about joint, like cartilage, tendon formation, if you're doing, I don't know if, if the same things are true of TRT, but I know that some of the problems that bodybuilders end up having, which is why they tear their muscle. I remember my business partners and I used to talk, if someone tears their muscle from the bone, I guarantee on steroids. <laughs> and uh, is that, like, have we gotten more modern with that? And that's not as much of a problem or are there things that you can do to support that? Yeah, um, there are things you can do to support it. But in general, I think that issue more stems from the fact that when people use super physiological amounts of hormones, as in more than they can naturally produce, they end up with strength acceleration that is exceeding what their tendons and whatnot can handle. So just because your muscle can force something up, it doesn't mean that all of the supporting infrastructure can also progress at that fast of a rate. But force production from androgens, the psychoactive effects are definitely significant on your ability to move stuff around that you wouldn't have been able to otherwise, even in Meaning the presence. Meaning you're recruiting more uh, of the twitch fibers or you're yeah, just like being you're, like a fucking psycho aggressive? Yeah, so it's like similarly to even stimulants, like there are things that can, you can acutely increase your performance even with the same amount of muscle because you can actually recruit more motor units than you would otherwise. Hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. So I, I feel like people are conflating the fact that people's strength outcomes and the things they're doing in the gym performance-wise are exceeding their infrastructure's ability to support those loads. Mm. Not necessarily that the steroids inherently are degrading all of these systems. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Talk to me more about estrogen. So if you have too much testosterone in your system, it gets turned into estrogen. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the common wisdom for an uneducated bro like myself would be you don't want estrogen, but obviously that isn't true. So is it a ratio between the two? And as testosterone goes up, I want my estrogen to keep pace? Or do I really want like a huge discrepancy and I just need some minor amount of estrogen? Yeah, the first thing you said is accurate. There is a enzyme called aromatase and that is what converts or aromatizes testosterone into estradiol. And this is the main prime, there's multiple estrogens and different metabolites of them, but the main primary dictator of estrogen functions is estradiol. And testosterone aromatizing into estradiol is done at a kind of like it's facilitated based on what you need in certain tissues. So you will have like site specific conversion to estrogen in your brain, heart, like all over the place. And your body's regulation of this is dictated by how much input it has from the testosterone, but also how much it needs to facilitate functions around the body. And this is actually the main dictating factor or one of them on how much testosterone output you have because just like you said there are a bunch of different things affected by one primary hormone with testosterone it converts into dht which is the thing that pushes you through puberty but also to estrogen and that facilitates uh brain health it's neuroprotective and this is why alzheimer's rates skyrocket in menopause Um, cardiovascular disease massively impacted by lack of estrogen, like it's very, very supportive of cardiovascular health and vasodilation, Mm. Um, multiple different things in the body. And having a lack of estrogen is counterproductive to health, performance, well-being. I mentioned the serotonin part earlier, Um, and even uh, erectile quality. So for somebody who is- Lack of estrogen. Yeah, so like a bodybuilder, for example, and I've experienced this personally, taking a bunch of steroids, tons of androgens in my body, but crushing my estrogen to nothingness with an aromatase inhibitor, I was literally asexual, essentially. Whoa. Yeah, penis only existed to urinate. That was the function of it at the time. Whoa. I also stopped caring about uh, dating entirely. I was just, uh, nothing mattered to Is me. Is this peak more plates, more dates, early days? <laughs> yeah, I guess That's so. really interesting. Yeah. What the hell? So was that, 
was that like a three alarm fire in your head where you're like, uh, I should want sex more than I do? Or were you like, thank God, that's some bullshit anyway. Like now I can focus on <laughs> no, what I want to do. I was just like, oh, wow. I, you, you almost don't even notice when it's happening. And I was dieting at the time too. So I just thought, you know, some of it is exacerbated by calorie deprivation because oftentimes bodybuilders will crush their estrogen levels to mm. try and, you know, like dry out for a photo shoot or a contest or whatever. Interesting. Dry out meaning you get really lean. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wet fat. Yeah. I always look a little soft. Oh, God. Like, it's not good. Yeah. I, in fact, I empathized with Liver King in the emails where he's like, lower back fat, man. I just can't yeah. shake it. Yeah. That's my woe. So crushing your estrogen will dry you out. Well, that is the perception, but I feel like it's a, a misguided one. I think that you can achieve a body composition that is dry looking as long as you're lean enough. Um, it's just, again, we're getting to the hyper extreme that's irrelevant for probably every single person listening, including us. So no one's going to get that lean where they would ever be in a position to want to crush their estrogen to even try and get dry. Like ultimately the main thing to know is estrogen is also very impactful both in men and in women for neurological health, cardiovascular health, um, facilitating sexual function, uh, mental wellness, mood regulation, just a myriad of different things. Temperature regulation too. Yeah, like women who are postmenopausal, like hot flashes, brutal. That is so interesting. The number of things that the body uses hormones for, you would think, oh, it has one function. If I see this in body, do this. Mm -hmm. But in reality, the body has wild amounts of context and it can use it in very different ways. When I heard that uh, mitochondria have hormone receptors on them, so they both generate and can receive, feedback via hormones, uh, I was like, I had no idea that A, that they had any receptors whatsoever, but that's really fascinating. How the body uses a relatively small number of hormones, neurotransmitters, et cetera, et cetera, to communicate and to get the incredibly complex symphony that is the human body to yeah. do what it's supposed to do at the right times. Yeah, it's wild how much stuff just like floats around in your body and goes to receptors and binds and then does stuff. Mm, and again, true. similar to the genetic predispositions, like some people who have uh, like sensitivity issues at the receptor might otherwise have an inability to facilitate some function because the receptor itself is not active enough to actually transcribe uh, gene expression. So they might have to take some exorbitant amount of fill in the blank drug or some other thing in order to facilitate something that otherwise was just suboptimal and not conducive to their quality of life or health. Hmm. Very interesting. So I want to go back to when your penis was just <laughs> for urination. Yeah, yeah. Did, were you, did that set off alarm bells or it just happened so slowly you didn't really care? <sighs> well, it happened quickly and it was like, hype. I was, it was apparent that this was happening, but I, uh, I guess over time you have pattern recognition and I've noticed multiple times certain drug interactions or using too much of an aromatase inhibitor or whatever would cause a situation where even I would have a raging libido, but then the my penis would have erectile no dysfunction erection. because I wasn't, I, don't know, I was using too many drugs that were overlapping or I was crushing my estrogen too much or whatever. Like, I was aware of it, but it wasn't really clicking that maybe estrogen is more important than you think. Like, these are things that, I don't know, sometimes stuff happens and you don't, aren't educated enough to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I just wasn't. Which, fortunately now, people are becoming more aware of the impact and why there is conversion to certain hormones and that just haphazardly intervening and just inhibiting the hell out of an enzyme might not be the best thing in certain situations. So... Which is great that people are becoming more educated now, though, because previous to that, there was, and still, like, very, very cookie-cutter prescriptions of TRT out there where it will literally, like, compound an aromatase inhibitor into your testosterone and force you to take it with your test mm. and stuff like that. So as long as people are aware of it, I think it is the most important thing. But back then, I had no idea. So I'm super freaked out by the fact that sperm counts are plummeting, yeah. that pre-pandemic, you had a third of like 20 to 30 something year old guys were had not had sex in the last year that that number has probably gone up since the pandemic which has isolated us more and more and so when i think about i don't know if it's microplastics if it's just being obese which is something we haven't talked about i think guys 
everybody needs to be super careful about carrying too much body fat. But when I think about uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're more likely to have elevated estrogen levels if you are obese than if you're not. You're nodding. Yeah, so adipose tissue will be a direct regulator of how much aromatase enzymes you have. So the fatter you are, the more estrogen potential you have as well. The more likely you are to get fatter, the more likely you are to increase, and it becomes a positive feedback loop? Indirectly, not because estrogen will make you fat. It's more because if you have more estrogen, that is more receptor activation, which is telling your brain, we have enough estrogen, but we had a lower amount of testosterone to get that amount of estrogen because you're fat. So the disproportionate amount of aromatase activity in that amount of testosterone, you have a disproportional ratio of testosterone to estrogen because you're obese. But estrogen is one of the main dictating factors that tells your brain, we don't need more estrogen, but what is it that makes estrogen? Testosterone. Therefore, less signal to your testes oh, and lower testosterone. Yeah. That's really terrifying. Yeah, so that obesity feedback system is like very, very uh, suppressive on testosterone in like an indirect way. And that's aside from like the metabolic dysfunction and all the other stuff that could cause it. Woof. Yeah. So do, are you unnerved at all by where we're going with young men being less, they pursue sex less? Um, yeah, like it's pretty uh, troubling. And I don't know how much of it is environmental, poor diet. Um, sleep quality is obviously diminished widespread now. Um, and then, but the, also the lifestyle factors are very, very impactful too. And it's all like, it's all combined and is, uh, you know, culminates into this, you know, clusterfuck essentially. Yeah. If you had to start teasing apart the clusterfuck and assigning like, not a precise percentage, but like, what are our big problems? Is it environmental factors? Is it dietary? Is it modern dating? And so you're getting into this weird, um, thing where your top tier guys are getting all the women and so this is creating a problem like if i had to start assigning blame i would i would a hundred percent say those three things so uh social media i'll round the cultural problems to that and then you've got bad diet is probably my number one the thing that freaks me out the most and then environmental factors like microplastics and things like that that are endocrine disruptors like those are my big three. Yeah, I would probably say tied for one is sleep and diet if I'm even allowed to do that in the scale we have here. Sure. So yeah, sleep quality, you know, I'm you obviously a big proponent of. What do you think fucks up people's sleep though? Mm, I, I forget what percentage it is, but it's like 80% of people use caffeine. I don't necessarily think caffeine's bad, but I think a lot of people abuse it and the half-life is like five hours. So factoring in, it's called pharmacokinetics when you factor in like how long it would take for a drug to work its way out of your system. It is still in your system. It takes 25 hours at minimum, depending on if you're a fast or slow metabolizer to like get it to a point where it's not, you know, significantly impactful on Whoa. maybe it could be like 20, depending if you do four or five half lives. But in general, it's like a full day of clearance, essentially. Mm. So people who are using it all day and pushing 500, 600 milligrams of caffeine, or even 300, 400, or whatever, if it's too late in the day, even if you perceive it's not impactful on your sleep quality, it could very well be. Um, so there's that. Stimulant abuse is rampant. And then also like that. drugs, Adderall, shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And those are going to negatively affect your ability to get to sleep, what stay you, asleep. Have you ever tried Adderall? Yeah. I've never tried it. Is it awesome? <laughs> uh, it's, uh, if you're dialed naturally, it will give you the short-term perspective that it's better, but I think in the long term, that becomes your acclimated set point, mm -hmm. and at which point you would probably, if you didn't medically require it, it's doubtful that it would be... It's kind of hard to say, because I know a bunch of people are shaking their heads right now like, no, it's fucking awesome, shut up. So That's interesting. So the drug I most wanted to try in the world was modafinil, and before I ever tried it, I told people, I really would like to get addicted to modafinil. I'm kidding, but that was like the joke. And then I tried it. And for people that don't know, modafinil is an anti-narcoleptic drug that like fighter pilots use. For sleep like apnea. Huh? 
Yeah. For sleep apnea. Yeah. I technically have a prescription for it. What? Does, yeah. It makes you stay awake. Exactly. So why have, would you give that to somebody? Oh, oh, oh. Because they're like, tired all the time. It's the ultimate band-aid because, and this is like a representation of the medical system as a whole almost, is if you have sleep apnea, rather than trying to fix your sleep apnea, let's give you a drug that keeps you awake. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's like narcoleptics, obviously that's a like a real problem that you can't necessarily fix. But with sleep apnea, oftentimes it's like a physical impediment of your neck being too large or you being obese or whatever. And that could be fixable. Or you use a CPAP machine and you manually, manually fix it, which is huge on quality of life and everything that comes from good quality sleep. And it will add decades to your life potentially if you're somebody you with... a CPAP machine? Yeah. Interesting because your neck is so muscly. Yeah, when I got my heaviest, it became very apparent that something was making me unable to get high quality sleep because I started within sitting down for five minutes within a university class, I would fall asleep what? and I couldn't stay awake for the life of me. And this is big from muscle big. And fat. Because when I would bulk up the most, I got to like, I don't know, 260 plus or something. And I would sit there with, uh, and when I was sleeping, I would basically be choking to death essentially every night. Whoa. Yeah. Is that a common thing among lean bodybuilders? Yeah. So muscle will do it, maybe not as quickly as but fat, again, but it will do it 100%. The distinction between natural and enhanced bodybuilders, I would say it's more common in lean enhanced bodybuilders than natural. Why would steroids play a role? Because you have like 40 to 50 pounds more muscle building potential than the But it natural. is still, it's the muscle that's the problem. It's, it's just, just that enhancing yourself is how you get that kind of excess Mass muscle. is the problem. So if it's fat or muscle, got it. Like either way, you are getting like a phys like gravity is working against you, and you have like a physical impediment of your neck while you're mm. sleeping. And this is why a lot of people with sleep apnea, myself included, if I fell asleep upright, I would not snore and I would not apnea. But if I lie on my back, all of a sudden I'm apneaing again. Mm. And it's almost worthwhile. Like I feel like anyone who's weighs more than I get, I don't want to put a number on it because this would be not like a medically qualified way to do this. But in general, just recording how you sound while you're sleeping, if you don't have a significant other to tell you, or just recording it anyways, and just hearing what, are you snoring? How bad is it? Sometimes people are shocked and terrified when they hear what's actually happening while they're sleeping. And you would never know unless somebody told you. And even sometimes significant others, they will just think you're annoying, loud snorer. I gotta, I'll go sleep in another room. I just can't deal with my husband, whatever it is, but he's actually like slowly killing himself. Whoa, yeah, that's crazy. Okay, very interesting tangent. So modafinil, uh, tried it, and I used it, so my wife is British, so we would routinely fly to London, and I was trying to really perfect my switching time zones, which by the way, for anybody that wants the time zone switch, like, it works like a charm. The second you wake up, get sunlight in your eyes, on your skin as much as possible. It is so much easier if you're going somewhere sunny and warm than it is going to London is nightmarish. It's eight hours, so it's you're only four hours off the exact flip mm. of Nightmare City, and it's always gray and cold. Yeah. And so very, very hard. But anyway, get your sun exposure. But I was trying to find a way to not feel that sense of like, oh my God, I'm so sleepy. And so tried modafinil, and what I found was that you still feel tired, you just don't feel like you're gonna fall asleep. And so I was like, it is better, but it wasn't enough better to feel like, oh, I've really solved this problem. Um, but the other drug that I'm very interested in is Adderall, just because I find, so I was diagnosed with hyperactivity disorder when I was young. Mm -hmm. But because I could sleep through the night, my mom decided not to medicate me, which I will eternally be grateful to her for because she had to put up with the hyperactive child. So I imagine there were times where it was pretty tempting uh, to medicate me to get me to calm down. Uh, but she didn't. Very grateful for that. But when I'm writing especially, I find myself like, ah, oh, my mind wanders to this, ah, oh, my mind wanders to that. And when I'm dialed in and I get so much done, I'm like, oh man, if I could just find this flow all the time, Adderall is my one temptation. Yeah, it's, uh, it kind of depends how it impacts you. And I guess my de description of what it was like for me would be probably different than most people, but I actually find I'm uh, almost more scatterbrained on it because it's, really? it's very stimulating. 
and it also elevates my libido significantly. You had me at hello. And, but paradoxically causes severe vasoconstriction. So you're oh, horny, but your dick doesn't work. There we go. Yeah, not great. So, not great. Oh, but it kills appetite so so much that you can extend your intermittent, intermittent fasting window to like 12 hours with relative ease. And then you have four more hours of not only are you hyper stimulated, but you're also way more mentally sharp just by nature of not eating food too. Mm. So there's that component. So there's a lot of pros and cons and it kind of depends on the person. That's interesting. So what's the, as somebody who is very slow to take drugs, what's the downside? Um, heightened heart rate and blood pressure, putting yourself in a state of perpetual sympathetic drive if you're on it every single day, which as much as you know about stress, putting your brain and heart in a state of perpetual stress, synthetically induced, is going to be problematic. Mm. Also, it kind of depends on which version of it you're using. Are you using an instant release or a sustained release? The half-life is gonna differ for how long it stays in your system. Mm. And as in a combo of two amphetamines, very, very potent in keeping you not in a state that can get to sleep and parasympathetic and calm and relaxed. So trying to be that guy who somehow like gets the benefits of it during the day and then perfectly shifts into your nighttime routine and then wakes up and is like totally refreshed and had the best quality sleep. Like how realistic is that? You know, it kind of depends and that's where you would have to use it and assess and then get your feedback from your sleep quality and all these kind of things and yeah, like I feel like the utility of it, even if it was via recreational use, would be on an acute basis, one to two times a week. Because once you start to exceed that, and depending on your dosage too, if you have too much dopaminergic activity, you're causing like cell death in your brain. Woof. Yeah. That I am definitely not keen to do. Yeah, drugs are really interesting. What do you think about the um, the cultural like promotion is probably the right word of weed. I think that, well, thing is, is it seems to have reasonable applications from a potentially health promoting perspective, but on the opposite. Say what? Do you the, smoke weed? No. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So keep going. On the opposite side of the spectrum though, it is potentially impactful on hormone production, may have some interactions with also sleep quality. It helps your latency. So you could technically get to sleep easier. That's why people mm -hmm. smoke at nighttime but it wrecks your REM. So people think that they are getting better sleep because oh. the perception of falling asleep is just, did my eyes close and I'm asleep? But the quality of it, most people aren't tracking. And in the long term, you are creating a dependency on it where you will have a harder time not using it to get to sleep, but also your REM is destroyed. Mm. So, you know, maybe there's some people who can take it and they don't, that might be too aggressive of a statement. It'll destroy your REM. Maybe it won't. Depends on the person. But there are a lot of people I know who, just take it because they think it helps them get to sleep, but don't actually check. Did it help your sleep quality or did it help you fall asleep? Yep. So, so my wife is no stranger to marijuana. Okay. And she was um, tracking her sleep and she thought it was broken because it was like, you had seven minutes of REM. <laughs> and she was what like, and, and that I think is a literal number if I remember correctly. Yeah. And she was like, there's no way, there's no way, the ring must be loose or whatever. And then we looked into it and it's like, weed messes up your REM sleep. She's mm. like, oh my God, like I can't believe that it's crushed that much. Yeah. Which is crazy. Um, why haven't you tried weed? I'm very curious it also seems to promote a level of apathy which i am not interested in whatsoever as the what i would consider like highly productive entrepreneur type so for me something that makes me just lackadaisically okay with floating around life isn't really conducive to anything about what i do so mm -hmm. for me it's it's not great like there's no application of it that i see as useful i don't have a desire to feel high I don't need it to get to sleep, which I don't even think it's good for that necessarily. And the kind of mindset it creates to me is not helpful. And if it makes me hungrier, I don't want to eat more. I want to eat less. And I want to, I get mentally sharp off not eating. So yeah. now talk to me about the, I know you no longer resonate with the name, more plates, more dates, but what about the concept of like getting, the, cause I think one of the most important things, if you want to be an entrepreneur and, or you want to get laid, get in shape. Mm -hmm. The things you will have to do to your mind in order to get your body there, it, it is, I will say emphatically, it's the single most impactful thing that you could do for the rest of your life, meaning all the areas outside of your life, uh, would be to get in shape. Agree or disagree? No, agreed. And yeah, obviously the impact it has on health as a whole, mental 
well-being, all that kind of stuff is huge. And if you look good and you're healthy and you feel good, that is going to manifest in so many positive outcomes that are outside of what you could even conceive probably. Like even if you're having job, I don't know, business presentations or job interviews or whatever it is, like it's only going to be helpful for sure. So I see no reason to not prioritize it as like the lowest hanging fruit that is the base infrastructure for everything you build on top of it. Like mm -hmm. your health is the priority, which is kind of funny because entrepreneurs will often skew in the other direction and neglect it, which I have to sometimes check myself on even because it's uh, oftentimes you can be, you know, grinding away for 10 hours and then, you know what, maybe I'll just, you know, finish these emails and I'll put the workout, you know, back another day. And then the next day comes, you know what, like, I'm probably fine. And then just skip another day. And before you know it, you haven't gone to the gym for two weeks. So it is something you need to prioritize for sure. And I think it's, uh, I think people know the importance. They just don't necessarily have the uh, habits formed or the fortitude to adhere to it necessarily, or potentially don't know where to start, which hopefully some of the education out there now, like it's definitely, there's enough information out there that at this point, if you're not doing it, it's kind of like, well, why the fuck not, mm. you know? So yeah, as much as the name of the channel, it's not like I would ever make an argument for like, no, if you put another plate on the bench, like you're gonna get more girls, that's certainly not the case. And at some point it's just like, especially when it comes to hormone augmentation, like girls actually care much less about the enhanced physique look than dudes do. Mm -hmm. So it's like at that point, you're kind of just boosting your own ego and doing it for the validation from other men rather than women. Because a lot of women are quite satisfied with an athletic, lean looking guy who's healthy as opposed to the jacket of his tree bodybuilder guy so there's that which is at least a comforting thing to know because some people think they have to look like the fitness model to get the you know top tier women or whatever but yeah like ultimately the concept as broadly as you want to take it applies where it's you know i talk about more plates it's like physique health gym fitness as a whole and more dates is you know at the time it was representative of kind of like lifestyle, but even though it's more dates. Um, so yeah, you know, I've thought about changing the name as I get older, it's kind of it's kind of gravitate towards uh, feeling like it's, oh, I don't want to associate myself with that name as much, but it's also what I built my brand on until this point. So it's hard to depart from that. Any thoughts yourself? Um, I don't think it really matters. So it isn't uh, it's not like a gross name. I think that it actually does point at something that is true. To your point, it's the dates you have to broaden out to mean less about um, just getting girls and more about when you have your life together and you have the kind of discipline that it takes to add more plates to the thing. It really, it really is exactly the same kind of focus and intention and doing hard things and pushing through difficulty that you're going to apply to be good at business but I actually wanted to ask you, so you're in like in it as an entrepreneur, building businesses. What is it that draws you to that? And is it the same thing that drew you to building a physique? Is it different? Yeah, there are certain niches that I'm interested in that I would nerd out on even if the businesses didn't exist. And one of those is pharmacology, hormone optimization, health in, health in general, preventative medicine as a whole. And then also dietary supplements sort of falls into that vein where it's things that are more on the straight edge, but also fall into optimization, backfilling things that are otherwise deficient or imbalanced. And how can I, you know, these two things were areas of interest for me before the businesses existed. So it makes it very seamless for me to transition into a model where I am making content about it, but also was already heavily researching it anyways, but now it's in a monetizable fashion as well. So for me, fortunately, I don't think I'm going to experience burnout. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe you give me some advice on that. But for me, I'm so highly passionate about the preventative medicine side of things in particular, and the supplements sort of is supportive of that to some extent, that I foresee myself doing this very long-term, enterprise value-minded. I am rewarded by the process more than the outcome. I have enough money to sit on that I'm good. And this is just where my area of interest is heavily lies and I'm hyper passionate about. So I don't really see myself deviating in any other silo because I'm so, I know what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I feel like not a lot of people can say that, but I actually know for sure, like this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Brother, this has been extraordinarily fun. Where can people connect with you? Uh, more plates, more dates on any social media platform, essentially. You can find me. I love it.
Keep watching if you want to learn the daily hacks to melt fat, lose weight, and live longer. One of the things that I want to really go ham on today, uh, because you cover it so interestingly in the book, is burning fat, changing your life through your diet, and the fact that people struggle with it, not because of calories, but because of a failure to recognize how individual we are. Um, walk me through that dilemma. Talk about how you approach it in the book and what the hell people are supposed to do with the fact that nobody is like them, which is something you mentioned over and over in the book. Help us. Yes, yeah, perfect, man. Yeah. So there's this term that we're really working to impress upon culture called your metabolic fingerprint. All right. Each of us has a unique metabolic fingerprint. And this consists of, of course, there's genetic components. There's microbial components. Mm. There's so much about us that makes us so diverse. There's nobody like you in the history of humanity who has the same metabolism. And there'll never be anybody like you in the future. And the craziest part, Tom, is that there's even yourself right now, your metabolism next week is going to be significantly different. It's constantly changing and evolving and adapting. And I'm really working to impress this upon culture because this cookie cutter system of nutrition has not, has not really given us good results if we just look at what's happening with our society. A big part of that, as you mentioned, when I went to school, I went to a nice private university, very expensive, they had a great pre-med track. And I took a nutritional science class which was an elective, I didn't have to take it. But I thought nutrition had to do with fitness, right? So I was like, okay, I'm gonna learn about how to be more fit. There was nuance there because, you know, I didn't really understand the difference between health and fitness. And so the very first day of class, the very first day of class, he said that if you wanna control your body composition, all you have to do is control calories. If you wanna control your health, we just need to manage calories. Calories were the tip of the spear. It was the thing that we were taught. If we can regulate this thing, this entity, then we can regulate our health. Now, the big problem is kind of manifested in culture is that there's actually these epicaloric controllers, right? Sort of like epigenetics, right? There's things that are above genetic control. Now we know there are things above caloric control that actually control what calories do in our bodies, which gets back to our unique metabolic fingerprint in a moment. But Getting that from my professor, and by the way, sidebar, my, my professor was borderline obese himself. And he was an incredibly brilliant man. And he was doing the things that he was, he wasn't like secretly going and like beer bonging like three musketeers or whatever. Like he was teaching us at the time, it was the food pyramid, right? Seven to 11 servings of whole grains each day should be the staple, the, the, the base of the diet. And in that system of thinking, all he did was he created learned helplessness because he kept trying to do the thing. He's just like, well, I just need 14 to 19 servings of whole grains and I'll get it. I just need to cut my calories more. And it wasn't working. And what we know today is that, for example, I'll give you one of the, the epicaloric controllers. You've said this before, Tom, you've heard many people say this. It's not just the calories, it's the quality of the calories. Just like with Sleep Smarter, it's not just the minutes of sleep, it's the quality of those minutes. And so now we've got a really interesting study. This was published in Food and Nutrition Research, and I mapped this out really well in Eat Smarter. The research wanted to find out what happened, what happens when you eat a meal of whole foods versus a meal of processed foods. Mm. And so they had some test subjects to consume what they deemed to be a whole food sandwich, which was multi-grain bread and cheddar cheese. All right. Now, that's, of course, is debatable. But now they've got the other group of test subjects consuming a processed food sandwich, which was white bread and cheese product. And some folks might be like, what the hell is cheese product? That's what Kraft is, Kraft Singles. They can't legally call it Kraft cheese because there's not enough cheese in the cheese, mm -hmm. but as I digress. So anyways, here's the most important part of this story. The sandwiches are the exact same amount of calories, the whole food version and the processed food set version. Same amount of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. On paper, same sandwich, it should have the same metabolic effect according to the calories in, calories out model. But here's what happened. After compiling the data, the folks who ate the processed food sandwich had a 50% reduction in calorie burn after eating that meal versus the people who ate the whole food version. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna pause it there. Why, how, how did they determine burn? 
Right. Yeah. So this is a great example, a little sidebar for everybody to understand the pathway of fat leaving your body or what we call this caloric expenditure. So that's one of the things we're demystifying and eat smart is like, where the hell does fat go? Where does fat go when you lose it? Where does this quote burn process happen? So number one, we've got when we're thinking about like eliminating fat, we are not we can't indiscriminately kill a fat cell itself. When you're born, you have about the same amount of fat cells that you have today. Um, what happens is the fat cells themselves get filled with contents, right, in the form of these energy packets like triglycerides. And what we're doing, by the way, your fat cells can swell up and they can become 100 times their, their size, their original size. So it's, it's crazy what fat cells can do. And so what, we're, what the goal is when we're talking about, quote, fat loss is getting the fat cell to, number one, open to release its contents. Then it needs to get shuttled to its end station, which primarily the mitochondria, to actually be burned at this metabolic power plant. And it gives off, this ATP gives off energy. But what they discovered was that about 84% of the fat that we lose is via carbon dioxide when we breathe out. So as you describe the sandwich, so first of all, the mildly processed sandwich, because even cheese is obviously processed food, um, does not strike me as the ideal barometer for whether this is accurate. So it's interesting that there are still pretty staggering results between um, mildly processed and extremely processed. And then what is your prediction? If they were to do that with like the Sean Stevenson prescribed whole food diet, would that reduction in burn from where you're at with a true, real, optimized whole food diet be even more Even dramatic? better. Yes, exactly. That's the point. That's the point. But that's getting back to what are your genes expecting you to eat? Because the further we get kind of mutated and away from the, the, the origin of a food, the more complex it becomes for our for ourselves to really recognize how to use that food, which created these what I call these hormonal clogs. So this is why there was this reduction in energy expenditure post eating that sandwich. Basically, their hormones, their, their tissues became much more stingy and hanging on to that caloric energy. And so fat cells not opening up? So that's number one. They, and this is, this is the part of the nuance. Like we can't identify, we the study know. doesn't identify, right, where is the clog happening, but we know it's happening. And I would argue that it's happening throughout the entire process, right? The fat cell being able to have its intelligence to do its job correctly. Because another thing, even if the fat cell releases contents, it can get reabsorbed somewhere else. So it needs to get to its end destination and then the process of metabolism with the mitochondria, the mitochondria have to be healthy and doing their job, you know? And so, so many pieces along this process can become, uh, can become damaged, you know? And here's the great thing about us as humans, we're very resilient. Like your body can sort itself. If you just look at us, like just look at what the body is able to take, how unhealthy we can be and still be kicking, you know? But also just imagine how good things can get as well, you know, when we give our giving our bodies the right thing. So our bodies are always seeking to get back into homeostasis. It's always looking for that. But it's also very resilient at helping you to survive. And one of the things that I really want to bring forward as well in this conversation of fat, because again, I didn't know we were, we were talking about this, but in our culture, we're trying to kill fat. We're trying to get rid of fat. We're, we have over 200 million people in our country are overweight or obese right now. And right now we have 43% of our citizens are clinically obese, moving towards 50%, half of our population within the next couple of years. It's insane. And I think you come from a similar circumstance. In my family, just say I got 30 close family members, 28 of them were obese growing oh, up. Sure. And these are, this doesn't mean that they're bad people. It doesn't mean that they're not trying. It doesn't mean that they want to be obese. It's just the nature of the environment that we're in and not really knowing how metabolism works. And so this idea of ind indiscriminately killing fat, we have to do away with that because our body fat is actually, it's pretty amazing. It's actually doing what it's designed to do. It's what's enabled us as humans to evolve and get to this point because it was this incredibly, incredibly intelligent energy storage system during times when things were a little bit leaner. And the problem is we, we don't have any lean times anymore at all. So you were a clinician for 10 years. I find your approach to talking about fat right now very revealing, and I'm interested to know why you take it. So uh, you're being very kind. Um, 
as a clinician, have you learned that you have to have a level of kindness to get people to start doing the right things? Like why lead with that instead of just saying like, cause your book ends with a prescription. You tell people go do this and look at you cage it a thousand different ways or, you know, hedge your bets saying that I don't like to prescribe things. Like everybody's different. Um, why are you leading with kindness when you talk about fat? Tom, oh, man, I love you. This is why I love talking with you. You know, it, it, I, it is very intentional. You know, I don't come from very kind circumstances, you know, like when I, was in college and, and figuring all this stuff out. I, I lived in Ferguson, Missouri, you know, and I lived in a uh, apartment complex, sleeping on a mattress on the floor. I never met anybody who went, went to college, let alone graduated, except maybe professors or something like that. But, you know, just from the environment that I was in, man, I was inundated with poor health and violence, you know, and even myself, I was kicked out of high school my entire junior year for fighting. I got kicked out of that same private university that I mentioned that you know, I went to in the first place. I got kicked out of that school for fighting. Who does that? Who goes to college and gets kicked out for fighting? I just grew up in an environment where we're taught to solve our conflicts with violence. And to, I, I say that to say, part of it is, I believe that humans are inherently good. And, but we are also products of our, of our, of our, of our environment, but we're creators of our environment as well when we become aware of it. And so once I changed the, started changing the inputs I was putting into my body, I didn't just become physically healthier. My, my thoughts changed, you know, my perception of reality. And I came across this quote from Einstein very early on. And I, I mentioned it towards the end of the book that the most fundamental decision that we make is whether we live in a friendly or a hostile universe. I love that quote so much. Man, like I get the chills right now because I look, I lived in what seemed like a hostile situation and I just start to see beauty everywhere, man. I start to see potential everywhere. I start to see the goodness in people because we're all just trying to get our needs met. And seeing in my clinical practice, nine times out of 10, the people making it to me, they had been, to they weren't treated with kindness. And so I started to lead with that and see people open up just when I let them talk. And here's a big tip for the coaches out there. If you let somebody talk, if you just ask them questions, they will tell you the cause and cure of what's going on with them. They already know. But we have to have the, the patience and the kindness to do those things. And also knowing that oftentimes, even though they were making the decision to put the food in their mouth, yes, but I'm coming from a place where I didn't know that there was a difference. I just didn't know. As soon as I got access, I started to make better choices. Now, you didn't know yeah. what, that there was a difference in the foods that you were eating, like the quality of calories? Exactly. Yeah. I didn't know that there was a difference between a fish stick and, you know, wild caught salmon. It's just food. It's just stuff, stuff that we eat. And we're just trying to survive, you know, let alone thinking about thriving and, and cognitive performance and all this stuff. We're just trying to get by, you know. But once I became aware of how much food mattered, that's part one, the awareness but part two is also the accessibility. I had to take myself outside of my environment, Tom, and actually, you know, go to, you know, mile on the other side of town to a wild oats, you know, like I had to make exceptional decisions to make those things happen. But investing back in myself paid off dividends. But most folks don't even know that that first part is an option to begin with. So we're leading with kindness. We're, I'm assuming, lowering people's defenses. We want to avoid the morality of food. I know online you always avoid sort of BS. Um, you talk a lot about not getting involved in arguments over minutia and staying like, hey, let's look at the sort of big swaths of what's actually going to make progress. OK, cool. So we're being kind. We're, I'm assuming we're encouraging people to be kind to themselves. This is not a moral failing if you find yourself unhealthy. What this is, is some fundamental misunderstanding. But you just said that people, if you let them talk, they'll actually tell you what to, what the fix is. So if they know what the fix is, why aren't they doing it? Mm, this is a great question. For me, there's two parts. Part one is the education. And this is huge. And you're a big proponent of this because you might know that there's an issue with something, but you might not be educated on why that is and also what to do about it, right? And so in the instance of food, I mentioned a little bit briefly about my indoctrination in my first nutritional science class, which again, my professor meant well, but he was teaching me something that was fundamentally flawed because it ignores the fact that your body is made of food. 
all right? My, my colleagues, I know the top cardiologists in the world, top gastroenterologists, top neurologists, the list goes on and on. They might go to school for 12 years to become a cardiologist and learn about food for two weeks. And your heart is made of fucking food. This is the problem. Like you don't even know what the thing is made of that you're treating. And then we're treating the dysfunction with a drug, right? You've got lisinopril, you've got statins. You're not understanding your heart is made from food. The blood running through your arteries is made from food. The arteries themselves are made from food. So the system itself is fundamentally flawed. So again, people coming in, they might be aware that, yeah, I need to change what I'm eating. I know that. But they're so far removed from understanding how powerful it is and what to do about it because of the cookie cutter stuff that, again, my colleague might get, get two weeks of training in, which is like eat a low fat diet, plenty of fiber, all this really superficial BS. And then they're telling their patients, you need to lose weight. How? How? Like, and so often, and I talk about this in the book, our system of healthcare has been so, treating the healthcare professionals so poorly. It's a badge of honor to absolutely destroy yourself in medical school and then try to pull yourself out of it, you know, and just so you see the high rates of suicide, depression, anxiety, obesity, dying from the very same things that they're treating. The system is flawed. And it's fundamentally because it's not appreciating the fact that we, as I'm seeing Tom right now, and as he's seeing me, we're seeing the food that we eat. It's That's remarkable. Crazy. That's really well said. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna start um, putting my finger on some of the things that I think end up causing people problems. This is obviously a world I'm extraordinarily familiar with. So put somebody on a low enough calorie diet, no matter what those calories are comprised of, I could give somebody a Twinkie with arsenic on it. And if it is low enough in calories, over time, if the arsenic doesn't kill them, they're gonna lose weight. They're gonna lose fat on top of a whole host of other problems. But like, what do you say to that, Sean Stevenson? Ooh, this is good. And there's actually a professor who did the Tweaky diet. Yes, he, he did. did. the Tweaky experiment. You know, just like, see, I told you guys, it's just the calories. Now, here's some of the fundamental issues with that. Because anybody who's just as, even as remotely versed in nutrition and just fundamentals of health, because again, our system of medicine just focuses on disease. Not what creates real health, but like, what is this impact that it's having on your neurotransmitters, this Twinkie diet? What is it doing to your pancreas? What are you making your heart cells out of, right? What is the long-term ramifications of, of a diet protocol like that? And so here's the, the term that I, again, I'm pressing upon culture is epicaloric control. We mentioned the quality of food briefly, but another one of these major controllers is the microbiome. And I know that, of course, you had folks talking about this on the show, but I wanna take this to another level because this has to do with your body's processing of calories. And research, and this was published in the journal Cell, really crazy study. They discovered that there's a certain bacteria that they found in mice that blocked their intestines from absorbing as many calories from the food that they ate, all right? Now through the lens of allopathic medicine, we just need to bottle up whatever bacteria that is and sell that shit. You Big know, just block people's basically. intestines, that's it. You know, block people's intestines from absorbing as many calories. You can keep eating what you want. Not understanding your body does not operate in a vacuum. There's no such thing as side effects. These are direct effects because everything's interconnected. One of the things I saw early on in my clinical practice, probably five years into it, I've been in this space for 19 years, but 10 years in clinical practice, probably about five years into it, I came across a study because so many people were coming in, statins were like, they were the hottest thing on the streets. All right, that everybody was coming in on a statin. And there was a study that came out revealing that folks taking a statin had a 30% increased incidence of having diabetes now, all right? Something was happening with creating abnormal blood sugar. You know, does this have to do with the beta cells? Does this have to do with insulin sensitivity? You know, that was open for debate, but we knew that it was happening. And so when you, when you try to treat that symptom with, okay, we just need to get everybody this bacteria, is this gonna affect my bacteria's ability to produce B12? Is it gonna affect my bacteria's ability to produce short chain fatty acids to protect my gut lining and pre prevent autoimmune conditions? We can't think about it in those terms. So here's where we do think about it. All right, so they discover this bacteria. Now we transition this over to humans. Now this was from researchers at the Wiseman Institute. So Tom, in my practice, I could have somebody send out for a stool sample, never even see them a day in my life. 
I can get their report back and know with a high degree of certainty whether or not they're obese based on the makeup of their microbes. That is insane. And so the researchers know- Now the question know, is really fast while you're on that side note, what comes first? Do you just have a bad roll of the dice and uh, you came out of your mother's womb and the microbiome that you formed happened to be obesity um, promoting? Or is it your diet? The microbes respond to the fact that you're eating Cheetos and all that kind of stuff, all your cheese-like products. Uh, yeah, which which comes first? It's a both-and world. It's a both-and world, Tom, because we are getting that download specifically from our mother. But one of the studies was done in identical twins, all right? You don't get more similar of a person to study or people to study to see the effects of one thing or the other than identical freaking twins, man. When they find a twin whose bacteria cascade is associated with obesity, insulin resistance, and, and weight gain, and then they find an, a, one of the other twins who has an, an a microbiome who's, that's associated with leanness, right? And they track them over years that they're, they're in the same household eating the same diet, but the twin who has the microbiome with the cascade associated with obesity became insulin resistant more often, became obese more often, than their lean microbiome twin, right? And the microbiome shifts based on our choices, based on our lifestyle, because one of the number one drivers, and I broke this down in Eat Smarter as well, what we discovered is that folks who are eating more of a, quote, traditional diet, they're hunter-gatherer, closer to that type of diet, they have upwards of four times greater diversity in their microbes than the average person in the Western world. We're losing our diversity like crazy. And a big part of this is we're not feeding the microbes their preferred food source for them to stick around in the first place. All right. So these are what we call quote prebiotics. And anybody can go to Google and look in prebiotic foods, but that's limited thinking. Like we got asparagus, Jerusalem artichoke, garlic, onion, uh, onions and garlic. That's small, small potatoes. Here's the truth. Every single food has prebiotic capacity. Every single real food for some strain of bacteria. And there might be a food that your ancestors have been eating for centuries that is suddenly stripped away by a diet choice or just by, by proxy, just by the environment that you're in. And suddenly you don't have that bacteria getting fed anymore. It has no choice but to become extinct in your system, right? And so what the researchers discovered was that the number one way, as your bacteria diversity goes down, your rate of insulin resistance goes up. Bacteria diversity goes down, your rate of diabetes goes up, your rate of obesity goes up, your rate of insomnia goes up as your rate of microbes goes down, all right? We know that they have an inverse relationship. The number one way to reverse and improve the diversity of our microbes is just so simple, is to just simply increase the diversity of foods that we're eating. Now, why does that work? I get why if I had depleted a population and I can bring back what is there, but if it's truly gone extinct, is there dirt on the food? Like, how am I repopulating if I'm not taking a supplement of some kind with a probiotic in it? Yeah, this is a great question as well. So number one, uh, in my practice, I put people on probiotics so frequently and we would get like these credible probiotic formulas. Some of them take like two years fermentation process, it's like wizards do spells over them, all kinds of shit. But we were missing the point because they, they're not able to colonize and to populate in the gut to do all the cool things that they can potentially do if they're not given their preferred food substrates, they're not given their prebiotic sources. And so to answer that question, yes, we do want to have sources of probiotics coming in, preferably through food, right? And we do go through that. But also, the most important thing, again, is not missing the point, and this is the, this is the point. When you eat a food, when you would just say we eat a berry, when you're eating that berry, you're eating a prebiotic and you're eating that berry's microbiome as well. You're taking that on yourself. So it, it is coming along with probiotic, with bacteria. It's just the nature of eating real food. Same thing with an avocado. You're eating that avocado's microbiome. If you eat some kale, you're eating that kale's microbiome. If you eat some walnuts, you're eating that walnut's microbiome. So we have this limited thinking that I need probiotic, you know, some kind of special probiotic food. I need some special probiotic supplement. No, 
we're, we're really missing the point here. Food already has the thing. But for many of us, especially where we are, we can like leverage, because I know some people have gotten some wonderful benefits adding in some fermented foods. Absolutely. But we don't want to miss out on this prebiotic because prebiotics are needed for the probiotics to make postbiotics. All right. So this is when they're making vitamins, minerals, short chain fatty acids in you for you. It's this beautiful symbiotic relationship. So I hope that makes sense. It does. I want to draw a straight line from the question about, hey, you can eat a Twinkie and if your calories are low enough, you are going to lose fat. And the punchline of what you just said. So here's what I'm taking away from that. You actually can, for sure, I promise you, you can lose weight eating anything if you keep your calories low enough. Now, some foods, because of the signaling effect of calories and not all calories are the same, you may have to restrict tighter and tighter and tighter on certain foods than you would on others. And so, yes, you can lose weight eating a Twinkie diet, but as you mentioned, not only do we have those kind of effects, but your blood vessels and all of that other stuff are made up of the very things that you eat. And in processing, the like at a cellular structural level and a signaling level, you're changing the material that you're taking in. And it's like, I get why people are obsessed with like getting shredded and being in good shape. But when you begin to understand that that is a thing that happens and that there's actually a whole host of things that happen, then people begin to think about it in the right way. Now, what I found amazing about your book is you call out directly, hey, boys and girls, don't worry about whether you're paleo, vegan, uh, carnivore, none of that matters. Listen to your body. Yeah. Now, what I want to know is, what the hell do you mean by that? (laughs) We're right now, there's a lot of infighting over minutia, as you mentioned that I said earlier. And these wonderful diet frameworks, these are my friends, you know, the top person in each of those. And they, the reason that they write these books and that they have these positions is that they see results for their patients. They see results for the people that they're working with. They're not trying to be negligent. They're not trying to ignore the data. They're helping people. But what's also overlooked is that there's a large percentage of people that each of their diet frameworks is not helping. And that's the truth. And a big part of that is Many of these diet frameworks, even though they can be wonderful, they can also imprison you and they can leave things out, make things off limits that you might need, that somebody else doesn't need, right? But also it might be protecting you for something, you know? So there's, there's balance there, but we have to have a little bit more agency over our thoughts, agency over our choices. And this gets into the discomfort of becoming more educated about who we are, you know? And fortunately, there's no easy way around this. You know, if you're really going to thrive and to, and to be the best version of yourself, we have to learn how we work. But the thing, the thing that I want people to understand, and just kind of going back, I, I gotta really wrap this point up because you really like made that hard line point about this with the Twinkie diet. Those researchers at the Wiseman Institute who understand about what's, you know, with the bacteria in mice, they took bacteria samples, fecal samples, which fecal, Transplantation is like one of the hottest things on the street as well. It's super weird, but it is. Um, but they take they took these fecal samples from folks who had a bacteria cascade associated with obesity and implanted it into lean mice. And then they took another set of fecal samples from human subjects who had a bacteria cascade associated with leanness and implanted that into lean mice. Those mice stayed lean. The mice who received the implants from the folks with the bacteria cascade associated with obesity, those mice became insulin resistant. They gained weight and gained body fat, not because of calories, not because they changed what they were eating, because of the bacteria. These principles supersede any of the ideas that we carry about just managing calories if you just get into a caloric deficit, because the mice are already eating the same thing, yet they're gaining weight. And I've seen, again, many other people listening, especially if they're in healthcare, people coming in, they're already at a thousand calorie a day diet, you know, and maybe they're six feet tall and their weight loss has been stuck. And then we, once we can have a certain level of like stepping away and not thinking we have all the answers and listen to the person, do some investigation, we might find out there's an underlying autoimmune condition, a thyroid issue, 
we might find out that inflammation is the causative factor. Because as you mentioned, we talk about that as well. There's so many things that control what calories do. Not to say that being in a caloric deficit can't just make weight fly off of somebody. Absolutely. But even within that, there are things controlling that person's metabolism that's going to outpicture different results from somebody who might be at the exact same height and weight starting off as them. Where I want to keep pushing on, though, is this notion of self-awareness and how you listen to your body. So um, I'll give you an example. When I first started working out, I had been working out for, probably for about eight months before I realized that you could fire your lats. Like you could actually send a signal to that part of your back and it would pull your arms down. And you have this understanding of, whoa, when I fire that muscle, I feel it. I can actually feel that muscle contracting and I now have a level of control. With food, it's the same, but it's like steering a boat. When you steer a boat, you do something, nothing happens, and then six seconds later, the boat moves. So it is very hard to drive a boat because you have to account for that leg. Food is insanely complicated. If you eat one thing and you're in a good mood, you'll be fine. You eat the same thing in a bad mood and it upsets your stomach. It's so complicated. I mean, that's just one of a bazillion different ways. But yeah. people don't learn to connect I ate this thing and I feel this way. I'll give you an example from my own life. About six months ago, Sean, I'm, I'm always sharp. And I was just like, just in the middle of the day, all the time, man. I was like way out of it. And then finally I connected that feeling with the word people use for brain fog. I had never understood what people meant by brain fog. And so all of a sudden I was like, is this brain fog? And I was like, oh my God, this is brain fog. I don't think I'm tired. This is, if it's brain fog, it is almost certainly something I'm eating. I end up tracking it down. It was pecans. I have no mm -hmm. idea why. I can eat pecans, but when I eat them every day, all of a sudden, because I'd gotten into this routine where one of my meals was made with a lot of pecans. It was amazing. And over time, and that was the worst part, it probably took four months of me eating those, that meal, almost every day to get to that point. But then once I was there, until I removed them from my diet, I couldn't shake it. No matter how much I slept, caffeine, nothing. I just felt that brain fog. Stopped eating them, was gone in like 48 hours. That's so crazy. And this is the thing is, it can be something so small and subtle like that. And what you're bringing up and how do we kind of get this inner guidance system back online? First of all, it's an acknowledgement that it exists because in our system, we are so focused on objective measures, which I'm very analytical, so I'm super into that stuff. But being able to track the, the data, the things that everybody else can measure, isn't even remotely close to how powerful your subjective experience is. Tell me something that matters more than how you feel. I'll wait, you know, <laughs> this is the thing, this is the most important barometer of everything in our life. And yet we, get, we pay so little attention to it. So basic metrics that we can pay attention to when we eat a meal, just seeing how does that make me feel? How does the digestive process feel? But so I think so often as well, we start to have these alarms that go off when we eat certain things and we just keep hitting the snooze button on it. Like, ah, you know, this fatigue is normal. This stomach discomfort. We get these different responses. Your body's giving you feedback that something's wrong. Something's not right here and yet we accept it as normal. And so that inner intelligence, we start to create a lot of static on the line, all right? So that's part of it, is being able to clear off the static on the line. And I wanna add another layer here, just with a little bit more science on what that static on the line can look like. There's this wonderful, I talk about the science of flavor in Eat Smarter, and there's this wonderful occurrence, it's something called post-ingestive feedback, all right? Post-ingestive feedback. And essentially through our evolution, whenever we would eat a food, your body, your, your brain, your, your tissues are essentially like taking notes. Like, okay, you know, we'll just say, just found some wild berries you ate. I got some copper from this. I got some selenium. I got some of some amino acids. I got a little bit of uh, omega-3s from the seeds. Your, your, your body is taking notes that when you eat that food is connecting a flavor sensation to those nutrients. And so now when you start to become deficient in those nutrients, your body can submit a craving, a craving signal to go and eat that food to get those nutrients back 
to where we need them to be. Now, here's the problem. Processed food manufacturers have really muddied up the waters of this post-ingestive feedback because now we can make things taste like different things all the time. And it doesn't have to be exact, but it's just enough to create enough biological interference that we don't even have that intelligence anymore, right? So a big takeaway from today and just overall for everybody is that chronic nutrient deficiency leads to chronic overeating. Chronic nutrient deficiency leads to chronic hunger. When we're having these deficiencies, part of the big reason why we're having uh, haphazard hunger and cravings, our bodies are driving us. It's not just the fact that we're addicted, right? That's it, That can be dismissive. Or they're just addicted to sugar. Well, they're probably deficient in damn near every single nutrient that they need to actually thrive, all right? And your body is going to keep compelling you to eat more to get those things in. That's how we evolve. And so having that process, you know, again, to become kind of skewed and twisted up, it just, it, it makes another layer of complexity of trying to figure out this inner intelligence. So to, to help with this, and I provided some very specifics in the book, but again, I'm very much on, we've got to experiment for yourself. But one of the things that was found to help to reduce the impact of, of hyperpalatable foods on our brain, funny enough, is chlorophyll. All right, chlorophyll. Was, yeah, chlorophyll is found to help to uh, reduce the urge to eat hyperpalatable foods and also to reduce neuroinflammation. Okay. Do you, do you take it as a supplement? So just in foods. You know, chlorophyll, anything green is going to be a good source of chlorophyll. So, of course, green leafy vegetables, but then you've got these super dense sources of chlorophyll like chlorella. You know, they even got its name, chlorella, from the high chlorophyll content, spirulina. But then you also get these other benefits there. Like with spirulina is one of the foods clinically proven to reduce neuroinflammation. And why am I bringing this up? Where's the interference in being able to know how we feel and what do we need? Tom, I want everybody to get this because you're not going to hear You're going to hear this in a few years. But right now, you, you're here here first with Tom Billiou. One of the biggest epidemics we're facing today is neuroinflammation, all right, inflammation of the brain. And one of the studies that I talked about uh, in the book, and this was published in the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences, they, they reported that specifically hypothalamic inflammation. And your hypothalamus is like, this is like your body's internal thermostat, re literally regulating what your metabolic rate is. Your brain doesn't give a shit how many, if you're trying to calorie count, your hypothalamus can tell your gut to reduce the absorption of calories that you just ate. Your hypothalamus can tell your gut to increase the absorption of calories from food you just ate. All right, these things are epicaloric controllers superseding that normal function. So what they discovered was that hypothalamic inflammation is one of the biggest driving forces of obesity because it's throwing off our metabolic rate, all right? And here's the other side. Obesity is one of the biggest causes of hypothalamic inflammation. And it's just creating this terrible loop where people can't get out of it. And again, I know my friends, you might have these diet frameworks, but if we're not explicitly helping people to reduce the inflammation in their brain, we might just be spinning our wheels here. But many of these wonderful diet frameworks, though, that are really worth their salt, they're accidentally doing it anyways. They're helping to reduce neuroinflammation. One of the foods that was, again, clinically proven to reduce inflammation, neuroinflammation, funny enough, and I, I'm, this is not an advocation to, for this food. It's just the data exists. I was shocked. Researchers at Auburn University found that oleocanthal-rich extra virgin olive oil is incredibly effective at reducing brain inflammation. And it's been found to repair the blood-brain barrier, right? Your internal security system, basically keeping things out of your brain that create more inflammation, that gets damaged over time, especially from you know excess sugar and the list goes on and on. But wow, I didn't know olive oil can do that shit. That's really remarkable. And what they found was this two to three tablespoons a day. And how do you go about that? There's nuance there too. You know, um, olive oil, if you've ever seen it in the stores, nine times out of 10, it's in dark glass. And this is because it's photosensitive. Light can damage olive oil, all right? And so you don't want it to be in clear plastic. That's already nasty. It's already messed up, all right? Number one. And also is this should bring up, well, should I be cooking with it? 
You can, and it might be healthier. Well, definitely healthier than these highly processed seed oils, you know, canola oil and uh, vet, quote, vegetable oil, but very low heat. But ideally, and folks traditionally, we're going to use it as a finisher. So your meal is finished, plated, and you drizzle some olive oil on. Use it to make dressings. People put it on sourdough bread. Talk to me about that. So massive individual variability. Nobody's ever going to be like you again. Nobody's had digestion like you. Nobody ever will have digestion like you. So you are doing an end of one experiment, whether you want to or not. How do people figure out what to eat? So this gets down to uh, principles and not, not written rules, not def definitive points, because again, everybody is unique. So there's going to be principles in every diet framework that are going to make them successful. And then there's going to be things that can make any diet framework go terribly wrong, right? So what we want to do is eat, eat in a way that number one, and I just mentioned this earlier, to help to reduce inflammation so that these internal guidance systems can get back online. This inflammation is, it's a really, it sounds kind of hooky, Tom. I don't know about you, but it just sounds, inflammation, inflammation, but it, it is a real problem because Inflammation, number one, it's not a bad guy. That's number one. We need inflammation. It's a functional part of our immune system, a part of our healing, a part of just cellular processing, period. We don't want no inflammation. It's a part of growth. However, chronic inflammation, inflammation where it's not supposed to be, like this heightened neuroinflammation, can really, really mess us up. So the biggest driving forces for most of us today with inflammation, specifically gut inflammation, is the consumption of pesticides, herbicides, rodenticides. And, you know, I, get, I did share one of the studies in the book finding conclusively a meta-analysis that pesticides do, in fact, not only create inflammation in the gut, but create abnormal uh, gene expression from your microbes, right? Your micro, most of our, if we go gene for gene, most of the genes we carry in our bodies are not ours, right? We're 99% genes of other, you know, our, our uh, bacteria cascade that we're carrying ar around with us. And so these things damage our gene, micro the microbial expression of our genes. All right. So this is not a small thing. And we've come to accept it as normal. And right now we have th literally thousands of pesticides have been approved by the EPA, so-called Environmental Protection Agency, supposed to be protecting us. Many of them have been recalled. Many of them are actually caught up in red tape right now, like chlorpyrifos, for example, that's been found study after study to lead to uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, specifically for development of babies and creating brain damage and, and creating skyrocketing rates of miscarriages. You would think it would be it would have been gone. It's happened so many times. It's disgusting because with these companies, it isn't innocent until proven guilty. It's innocent until it cuts into their bottom line enough, the lawsuits, because it's just, you know, it's just business as usual. They already have a certain amount of set aside for all the damage it's going to cause. So it, when we're talking about avoiding pesticides, this isn't a, it's not a trendy thing that I'm talking about here. These chemicals are not designed for human consumption, but the premise is, it's generally regarded as safe because we're a bigger organism. We're bigger than the little pest that they're trying to kill, but things bioaccumulate in our tissues, and number one, and number two, we're made of little things, smaller than those damn pests. We're made of these things, and they're damaging our microbes, they're damaging our cells. So do we avoid that by eating organic? Organic, there's nuance there with organic, but it's gonna be a generally a good step to make. And we can do that ourselves, and as we continue to demand it, there's gonna continue to change what's available in the market, for sure. So. And also a, a way around that, because again, not having a lot of money, I, I would start to go to farmer's markets. There was a farmer's market in Ferguson and meet the farmers, ask them, hey, are you guys spraying shit on your lettuce? You know, and they're like, absolutely not. You know, and they're just talking to them, learning, you know, there's many and it's much less cost. Right. I can get three times the amount of lettuce that I was buying at Whole Foods or whatever there for the same amount of money. So. Um, so, yes, avoiding the things that are damaging this internal intelligence that are damaging our, our metabolism, right? So that's just one. But then adding things in as well that help to reduce inflammation. 
So what does that look like? One of the most important time, and I'm going to say this again and again, because this has, this has to do with metabolism, but also it has to do with our sleep quality. It also has to do with our cognitive performance. And I know this is important for you as well. And this is the need to make sure we're getting in plenty of DHA and EPA. All right. This is so freaking important. I don't even want this to, if anybody does anything from this episode, I want to make sure that you're getting in enough omega-3 fatty acids in the form of DHA and EPA. So number one, DHA and EPA have express lanes. If you want to think about the blood brain barrier being like a toll booth, they have express passes to get into the brain. Like your brain sucks them up like in droves because they're needed for structure of your brain cells. Omega-3s function as structural fats in your brain, creating plasticity, creating stability, and tr signal transduction so your brain cells can actually talk to each other. Without omega-3s, shit goes wrong real fast. To the degree, one of the craziest studies in the book, they found that the folks who had the lowest intake of DHA and EPA had the highest rate of brain shrinkage, all right? Your, your brain literally shrinks rapidly if you're not getting these fats in. And so what it was was just under 1.2 teaspoons a day. Anything under that increased the rate of brain shrinkage. What are the best three foods or supplements to get your um, DHA and EPA? Okay, perfect. Food first, fruit first. The Journal of Neurology found that folks who consume just one seafood meal per week do in fact perform better on cognitive skills tests. I think that's a direct one-to-one -one response to those omega-3s. Uh, but if, you, if you're not taking a, if you're taking a vegan or vegetarian protocol, I've got news for, good news for you too. Uh, but food first, and then of course there's grass-fed beef in that same spectrum, has omega-3s, a high ratio of omega-3s, uh, eggs. The best food source though, Tom, is not the fish, the fatty fish, but the fatty fish eggs. So salmon roe and caviar can have three times more DHA and EPA than the fish itself. And then we've got, from there, most of the studies done on DHA and EPA is done via fish oil. All right, so I did share some studies in the book that are just really shocking when it comes to fish oil. But then from there, the next rung down is krill oil, right? Krill, that's a microscopic shrimp, super dense in astaxanthin, which makes your body absorb omega-3s even better. It's incredible. And that might be for somebody who's doing a vegetarian protocol, wherever that lies on your ethics, krill oil might be a savior for your brain. If anything, everybody today, even if you're taking a vegan protocol, please get yourself an algae oil, all right? A high quality algae oil. It has the DHA and EPA there, but we don't have clinical studies now to see its effectiveness but we do know that it's there. And I just don't want you to wait around for that data. DHA is so important for your brain. Just to be clear, this is the plant source is ALA, right? This is what you find in chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds. I would have patients get flaxseed oil for years. I was missing the point. It's not the same as DHA and EPA, but it's so important for your brain that your body can convert some ALA into DHA, but you can lose, depending on your metabolism, your unique metabolic fingerprint, you can lose 90% in the conversion process. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have to eat five bags of chia seeds a day to get what your brain needs. You know, it's just not doable. And plus, you probably want to leave the bathroom at some point. Um, so that's that's that part. And I also want to share this really quickly with uh, omega-3s and omega-6s. This was a study, and this was published in the journal Nutrients. And it found that a large increase in the ratio of omega-6s in the diet compared to omega-3s directly increases our, our risk of obesity. But here's the most important part, listen to this shit. This, another study, and this was highlighted, and then I broke this down, and I'm, I'm getting giggy, giddy right now. Another study highlighted eating smarter, found that an imbalance in omega-6s to omega-3s leads to dysfunction of your hunger-related hormones and increased fat storage. Even with calories being the same, even with calories being the same, People with a higher intake of omega-6s gained more weight and more body fat and had mis more dysfunction to their hunger-related hormones, hmm. all right? Epicaloric controller. Omega-3s help to reduce inflammation. Omega-6s are not bad, but we need more omega-3s right now because we've become such a omega-6-dominant society.
Click here now to learn the top foods that melt fat, build muscle, and prevent chronic disease. Six out of seven people who go on a diet lose weight. It's pretty simple. It's not easy. People don't adhere long-term to diets. About 90 plus percent of people